career as a pharmacist, I decided that I would go back to school and look for other avenues to help people and went back to school, became a, a counselor. Um, I've been licensed um, in Mississippi for, I don't know, 17 years and licensed in Arkansas. And so kind of that dual, I do kind of both. Um, at the same time, I think that um, the education I had as a pharmacist is very informative to what I do as a counselor. Um, you know, if you look at just the first couple of slides on the PowerPoint, and I'll put that up in just a minute, you know, medication is a routine thing now. Um, it was not quite the routine thing 30 years ago when I was in pharmacy school, but it was some of those changes that were starting to happen, uh, pushing for, you know, insurance companies pushing for medication to be the answer. Uh, it's more cost effective or it saves money. Uh, I'll argue with that many times over is it's useful and beneficial, um, but there are plenty of times where medication is not the answer. Um, medication might be the answer with some therapy, but medication alone is not the answer. And so I started my pharmacy career when the uptick started happening with kids being uh, medicated for ADHD. And I saw a lot of kids being put on medications and me thinking, I really don't think they need to be on this. I really don't see them um, as being <clears throat> in a place for this is the first um, answer of things. And in the state of Mississippi in 1989, when I became a, a pharmacist, when I was licensed as a pharmacist, you know, mental health wasn't a big thing. I mean, licensure in the state had been around for, I don't know, 10 years maybe. But, you know, as a, there wasn't a lot of counselors around, there weren't a lot of people working with children. And so it's one of those things of, if I ever get a chance to go back to school, I'll go back to school. I did it, went back to school. And um, just couldn't stop then. So, you know, basically I did the undergraduate in psychology. I did the master's in counseling and did a PhD in counselor education and supervision. And so I've kind of been teaching uh, psychopharm and things like that uh, to counseling students for many years. So let me go ahead and share my uh, uh, screen and this. So let me know if you can see it. I always like to know, are you actually seeing what I'm, what I'm projecting? Looks okay. Great. All right. Great. So um, I also like to do editorial work. I'm an editor of a couple of journals. One's a regional journal and one's an international journal, but that's beside the point that has nothing to do with psychopharmacology. Um, what, we, what are we going to try to do today? We're going to understand medication and how medication works and how you can understand this and be a really good advocate for your clients is you need to know something about neurobiology, neurotransmitters, and brain functioning. Um, you need to be able to in, identify some of the common mental health medications and how they actually work. And then kind of start to look at the perspective of, well, how do medications interact in mental illness? And we'll, we'll talk about that as we move through the three hours. And a, a lot of times we have symptoms. Symptoms may line up with a specific diagnosis, but the symptoms themselves may not be the diagnosis. And a good example of that is, uh, someone who's experienced a lot of trauma and abuse can easily display the symptoms of ADHD, but they're not ADHD. And so the perspective there is, are we taking enough time to accurately understand what's going on with the clients um, before we're referring them for medication? Or uh, maybe, um, you know, is the medication itself producing some side effects that looks like symptoms and does that then make them look like they have a different mental disorder? So it's a really complex thing. Um, you know, we can try this from the perspective of if you have questions, just ask questions. If that gets out of control, then we'll just say, I'll say, you know, stick questions in the chat and, and we'll answer them as we go. We'll probably have some time left over at the, at the end to answer questions that may be kind of lingering. Um, I won't read through that. I've already said some of that. Um, best website to get really good research. Um, there's a lot of references out there. There's a lot of, of resources out there. But if you want to look at uh, a website that has really good information about uh, the research behind medications for specific things, um, I'll recommend the Agency for Health Healthcare Research and Quality. 
Uh, it's a branch of HHS, and basically their goal is to actually look at all the research that's out there and kind of report, you know, what is the research actually pointing to this is useful or is it not pointing to it? Is the research good? Is the research, you know, is it lacking in some way? And, and so basically, if you ever go to their website, they do have a whole mental health section and that includes not only research on medication, but also research on different treatment strategies for different mental illness. And so I always like to tell everybody about H um, AHRQ. It's a great uh, reference. Um, I can tell you that their research reports are very long and very boring. Um, there's one that the first one I read about eight years ago um, was 314 pages long. So they always give you a synopsis that's about 12 pages. Read that. Don't read the 314 page thing because it will take you into uh, a place of where you'll fall asleep. The brain is complex. Um, this is a really simple slide showing the major neurotransmitter pathways in the brain. Each, um, each tra transmitter pathway is color coded. Um, and this is very simplified. This is if you would actually look at this kind of neurotransmitter pathway at a time, one at a time, you would see it's much more complex than this oversimplified uh, kind of diagram. But this diagram itself shows you how complex it is. Um, what you see in this diagram is you'll see different colored bodies, and then you'll see different color pathways. Um, neurotransmitters start in certain places within the brain and they project to certain places within the brain. Um, for every neurotransmitter pathway, there's kind of a backup system that comes in to slow it down or speed it up. So uh, everything within our brain neurotransmitter pathway was kind of has this loop effect. And there's something that initiates it. There's something that then comes and slows it down. We are complex. Um, this is, a, I love this slide because it's a good example of all the chemicals necessary for just uh, the an experience of an emotion. You have cortisol involved and dopamine and oxytocin, serotonin, endorphins, norepinephrine, prolactin, estrogen, testosterone, vasopressin. It takes all these things just to have an experience. And so um, what this should demonstrate for you is how complex everything is. If you interfere with one thing within the system, you then affect everything else. That's a good example of how medications work. Medications work to interfere with something or to produce something. By doing that, then they have an effect on something else. There's always some other kind of side effect with uh, of medications. It may be a good side effect, it may be a bad side effect, but um, we're a complex system and anytime you affect one thing, you're gonna affect them all. They're all tightly connected together. You have to remember the nervous system. Um, think about the central nervous system is the primary part of the nervous system that we think about when we think about mental health medications. Um, the peripheral nervous system is very much involved in our you know, mental status, but at the same time, um, we, we think more about the central nervous system as in your brain and things like that. The thing about the peripheral nervous system that's important is the sympathetic nervous system. We've spent decades looking at the sympathetic nervous system and, and in that sympathetic nervous system is where we're seeing a lot of, of medications you know they affect the sympathetic, sympathetic nervous system they affect the central nervous system they we, we haven't spent a lot of time over the last over the last two or three decades looking at the peripheral nervous system the peripheral nervous system has gained some attention uh, over the last 10 years or so uh, specifically looking at um, some theories and models of, of how we exist, some models of how we moderate and regulate. Uh, a good example of something that kind of looks at the peripheral nervous system is if you want to look it up, look up polyvagal theory and what the polyvagal theory is saying about the involvement of the, the parasympathetic nervous system within, the, within our existence. Another thing to note is most, if you're, if you're reading textbooks, most textbooks mention the parasympathetic nervous system and the sympathetic nervous system, but they don't mention the enteric nervous system. Um, enteric nervous system has been known for a very long time. Um, it was in fashion to talk about the en enteric nervous system 30 or 40 years ago. 
um, it fell out of favor. And so you don't always see it mentioned in, uh, in textbooks, but it's back in fashion again. So there's a lot being written and talking about the enteric nervous system. And so the enteric nervous system is actually the uh, nerves that are in your intestines, in your gut. Um, and basically the whole idea of having a gut response uh, comes from the enteric nervous system. What new research is showing us about the enteric nervous system is it is so complex, it is so um, intricately organized that the enteric nervous system could actually be a second brain. Um, it, so the gut response, it may be a sensory response, but it is highly uh, evolved and, and, and the idea of we should be paying attention to what our gut response is. It's not there just for fun. It's there to actually give us information and, and we should actually pay attention to what our gut is saying. Uh, within the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system, how they differ, how they're different actually. The sympathetic nervous system arouses things. Uh, the parasympathetic calms them down. So as I was talking about earlier, you know, if there's a neurotransmitter pathway, there's probably a, a pathway that leads back from it to slow it down. Think of that kind of, as the sympathetic and parasympathetic. If your sympathetic nervous system stimulates something, your parasympathetic nervous system is there to have control over the sympathetic nervous system and to slow it down, to act kind of like the brakes in your system. All neurotransmitters, all of our, all the communication between neurons, cells, are, mod, are, are, are modulated by your endocrine system. Hormones act as neuromodulators for neurotransmitters. So what does that mean? If, if something happens to throw hormones out of balance, your neurotransmitter system will, come, will get out of balance as well. If you don't have the neuromodulator, the thing that's kind of in the middle there to help make everything function well, if you don't have that there, if that's not there in the right amount or the right you know, the right proportion or whatever, then the neurotransmitter system's not gonna work. So endocrine system is highly involved in the, the whole idea of sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system and, and your neurotransmitter system because it acts as that kind of connected thing, right. the neuromodular, yeah. I'm so sorry to interrupt, but the students are asking if they'll be able to get copies of the slide. Oh yes, you are welcome to this. I'll, I'll make it available to you as soon as we're done. Yes, thank you so much. I'll make it available to everybody. And if you want to even send it to me during break, I can make a drop. I can do that. Okay. I will we'll gladly do that. that everybody. All right. Thank you. Yep. Sorry. Sure. No, no worry. So the, the brain, I like to talk about the brain and your main four lobes. You have the frontal lobe, the occipital lobe, parietal lobe, and temporal lobe. So you see the frontal lobe is, is involved in self-regulation, problem solving, goal setting, and, and social cognition. The frontal lobe is the last lobe of the brain to fully organize. Um, it, it's, it's one of those things that it starts to organize around 8, 12, continues to organize well into your 20s. It's, it's responsible for your higher cognitive functions. You know, the, the idea of being able to be abstract, to have uh, executive control over things, to be able to reason and rationalize things. Uh, it is the it is the longest forming and the last to completely organize and form. Your occipital lobe, um, it's involved in vision and perception. It starts to develop and is developed pretty early. Um, think about babies and think about them beginning to see things. Their 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 ability to focus in on things. As we age, also we we develop the ability to have perception and perceive things. The parietal lobe is involved in sensory motor perception and spatial abilities. Um, oftentimes, trauma and abuse in the early years, like between one and three, one of the areas of the brain that's most easily damaged as a result of trauma and abuse will be the parietal lobe. And so what you see then come out of individuals that have had this is they have oftentimes they have some sensory motor or spatial ability deficits. Um, that's due to an impact on tra of trauma and abuse on the, the development of the diencephalon. We'll talk about that a little bit later. The temporal lobe is your hearing, language, memory, and social emotional functioning. That also starts to develop early. You think about babies once again, how their hearing becomes more acute, how their ability to, to speak starts to develop. 
um, after the first year and they and they start to develop language and things like that. So different parts of the brain, diff- developing at different times, um, but all very much important. It's all four lobes of the brain together that give us our existence and working together and doing their part within the whole idea of who we are as human beings. So at birth, uh, we're born with about 100 billion neurons. I can tell you it was probably a graduate student working in a neuroscience lab that actually counted those. I worked for a year and a half in a neuroscience lab and we would section rat brains and count cells within rat brains. And so somebody, probably a doctoral student counted those billion neurons um, because how else would we know this? We Basically what you do is you, you look at a slide and you count how many cells or neurons there are per centimeter. And then you kind of, you know, add this to the, or multiply this by the whole total dimension of the brain and you get that 100 billion neurons. By the time a, a child is two years of age, their brain is actually 80% of the size of an adult. Uh, it's not functioning at 80% that of an adult. It just grows really quickly uh, to a greater size. That's why little kids have big heads. Think about small children, their heads are about as big as their shoulders are. So what keeps happening? Well, glial cells within the brain keep um, developing, neurons keep making connections until about age three, um, you have about, a, by, the, by the age of three, you have about a thousand trillion connections between all those neurons. And so the goal of early brain development is to make as many connections between neurons as possible so that as we age and as we use our brain, the brain can more or less prune and get rid of some of these connections and only leave the ones that are around that are actually necessary. The goal is to, to the, for the brain to develop as quickly as possible for survival and for learning. We don't need all of that. We get rid of the things that we don't need. Um, as a result of trauma and abuse, we get rid of things that we actually need. Things are pruned that we actually need because of the, uh, the traumatic situations. But We have, uh, in early life, we have a lot more in our brain than we actually need, and then we get rid of what we don't need. So there it is, the overproduction of neurons and connections. The the selective reduction of neurons and connections starts to happen um, after the age of three. Um, What this, what we would refer to this as is a sensitive period. If the brain is in a reorganization period, if the brain is in a, what we call a, you know, kind of a flux period, we call that, that period sensitive in that the idea that the brain is, is changing a lot during these age spans. And so the brain is more sensitive to outside influence. Um, sensitive periods, uh, there's a lot of different ones. If you look across research, you're going to see um, there's a sensitive period between one and three. There's a sensitive period between four and five, and then there's another one between 11 and 12. Um, other, some research says there's some more, but these are the primary ones that are actually, that are actually listed more and more in research. Um, these sensitive periods and the time when the brain is changing a lot are, are done naturally so that the brain is getting ready for what's next. Um, the first three years of life is about attachment and developing relationships. Four to five is actually your brain that's kind of gearing up for those first school years. And then when the sensitive period around 11 to 12, it's actually gearing you up for adolescence. And so they naturally occur, they're programmed to occur at certain ages and age spans. Um, if you look at research, you'll see sensitive periods mentioned and you'll see critical periods mentioned. Critical periods are early brain development, first year or so of life, they, they start and stop very abruptly. Sensitive periods are much slower. They occur later in brain development and they're much more of a kind of a, a slow process of, of development. They're not this turn it on, turn it off kind of thing really quick like a critical period is. The occipital lobe shows the pruning the, the earliest. Uh, the frontal lobes show growth of neural connections and pruning longer. Uh, frontal lobes and the temporal lobes show pruning for a longer period of time over the over the course of brain development. Um, if if you're thinking about or if you're wondering when is the brain changing the most, this is not a critical period or a sensitive period. Between two and five, the brain is in the greatest period of change that it will have throughout its development, two to five years of age. 
myelin. Myelin is on a neuron to help it connect to other neurons. It's to help it be conductive. Uh, if you think about myelin, think about an electrical cord. It's got that plastic coating on the outside. That plastic coating on the outside is there so that the electricity is conducted through the cord efficiently. Myelin acts the same way. Myelin you know, covers that neuron so that the electrical or chemical impulse that's going down that neuron is done as efficiently and as productively as possible. Oftentimes, um, trauma and abuse, head injury can damage myelin. And once myelin is damaged, then you have less conductivity or less efficiency of the neuron. Uh, a good bit of the, the damage caused by traumatic brain injury is not so much about the structural damage of the brain, it's about damage to the myelin around neurons. Without that myelin around the neurons, your brain can still conduct signals, you know, get things accomplished. It's just not as efficient. It's not as, it doesn't have the same ability um, as it would if the myelin was present. So myelin begins to form early in life and we're, we're, we're still myelinating uh, our neurons well into our 30s. Uh, some research says we're myelinating until we're in our 60s, you know. Um, if you look at some research, research around trauma and, and its impact on the brain, if you look at an image of a normal child versus a traumatized child, one of the things that you will notice if you're seeing these images is um, the brain has bigger gaps in it if you've been traumatized and abused, whereas in a non-traumatized abused individual's brain, um, their, their brain doesn't have gaps in it. The ventricles within the brain are not still very uh, produced and very pronounced. Um, the reason why there are bigger gaps within the spaces of the brain and because of trauma and abuse is because as a result of trauma and abuse, the brain is not myelinating its neurons as well as it should be. Um, with therapeutic intervention, we can start the myelination process again so that the brain begins to fill in. But that's one of the big things is to, if you compare a normal brain to a traumatized brain, you're gonna see gaps in the traumatized brain not the normal brain, and that's due to a lack of myelination. This is one of my favorite slides, kind of showing you everything across a lifespan that goes on with with critical events and things that are that are going on in the the, the morphology of your human brain. This starts at conception and goes all the way well into our 60s, and and you see things like synaptogenesis and. Um, when the, the, the brain is those first few years of life trying to make all those connections. Uh, you'll see programmed cell death. That's the brain getting rid of things that it doesn't actually need. Here's your myelination down here. And we, we start myelination early, around 12 weeks, and it's going on well into your, your 30s to 60s. And then dendritic or axonal arborization. So after all the synaptogenesis occurs, one of the things the brain starts to do is we've made these connections between the neurons. Now let's use the other end of the, of the neuron. Let's, let's use those dendrites there. Let's let them make connections with other dendrites across the synaptic cleft. And so the more connections we have on both ends of a neuron, the better the brain is at conducting a signal. So the whole idea of think of, of dendritic and axonal arborization, think about a tree. It's like the tree is growing and, and the, the branches of the tree are stretching out and growing and growing and reaching out. Um, the longest periods of the, the longest part of the brain that is, you know, developing is the, the parts of the brain that lead to higher cognitive function. So that I mentioned this earlier, the frontal lobe is the last to fully develop because it's involved in self-regulation problem solving, a lot of very complex activities. Um, there's a lot of growth. We've already talked about this in the brain between one and a half to three to four years of age. Um, the areas of the brain that take the longest to develop are also in many ways more sensitive uh, to the effects of you know, injury, trauma, and abuse because they're developing slowly over a longer period of time than the parts of the brain that develop pretty quickly. The brain is activity dependent. And that's the most important thing on this slide. It, it, you truly will lose it if you don't use it, uh, especially in early brain development. The, the brain is use dependent. 
there are certain things that the brain needs to uh, stimulate brain growth or neuronal activity. Uh, if those things are not occurring, then the brain more or less looks at it and says, we don't need this neuronal pathway, we can get rid of it. Uh, a good example of that is attachment. If a child is not getting the nurturing that he or she needs, um, the, the part of the brain that's involved in the whole attachment bonding um, fails to develop. Uh, the brain may prune it away, uh, leaving the brain in a state of, since we don't have this, this ability to connect to people, um, what do we have left? Well, the opposite of connect is withdraw and avoid. And so the avoid withdrawal mechanism becomes more pronounced than the connect and bond with me mechanism. And so one of the other things I like to mention here is what might impact brain development's medication. Um, realize that most medications have not been studied in small children. They, there are some studies that look at children on medication, but one of the things that most research projects fail to look at is what's the impact of a medication being taken when a brain is in development. Um, most research around medication comes from adult studies. Adults have developed brains. Um, so many of the side effects, many of the detriments that come from using medications uh, come from the fact that they've not been studied and they don't, there's not necessarily great data around how does this impact or what does this do to brain development. So if you think about your brain and how it's developing, your brain develops from the bottom up and once it's developed, it controls from the top down. So what does that mean? Control from the top down, the, the whole frontal part of your brain, the cortical area of your brain, once it's fully developed, it should be your primary ability to control, control yourself, your, your ability to rationalize and reason, to, you know, to have social emotional information functioning, being able to look at abstract stuff and, and make sense of it. Um, if, if that cortical area hasn't developed, then the next area, what was what would have been developed before the cortical area is probably where your brain is stuck and this is what's controlling your thoughts and your emotions and behaviors. So the cortical area, once it's developed, should be our our greatest ability and our you know our greatest defender. Um, as a result of things like trauma and abuse, the cortical areas don't always develop the way they should. And so you, you have to look at it from the perspective of um, what is the individual's ability um, at this point in time? Is Does this individual have the ability to rationalize? Do they have the ability to problem solve? Uh, if not, then what is controlling them? And that's where you kind of focus your treatment. So if your brain develops from the bottom up and controls from the top down once developed, there's many things to think about in this. And so what does it mean for your brain to develop from the bottom up? In the first year of life, your brain stem develops. Um, that's important for regulation of sleep, arousal, and, and your fear response. Think about babies again. Think about in the first year of life, they're settling into a routine. They're settling into a routine of sleep, wake, eat, things like that. Um, that part of the brain, the brain stem is, is involved in those, those functions that are not necessarily what we try to control. They're more automatic in nature. Um, and after that part of the brain develops and you develop these patterns, these, these sleep-wake patterns and things like that, then the brain starts to focus its attention on the diencephalon. And so the diencephalon starts to develop between one and three. The diencephalon, if you look at, a, if you look at an image of the brain, you're not gonna find an image of the diencephalon because the word diencephalon is just a, a word that represents many different things there's the telencephalon, there's a bunch of different cephalons. The diencephalon just represents a lot of smaller structures that make up the structures uh, that are involved in your integration of sensory input and your fine motor skills. And so <clears throat> the whole idea of the diencephalon, this is the part of the brain that takes in all of the sensory information from your different senses, makes sense of it, and sends it to the part of the brain that needs it to make, you know, to have a response to it a verbal response to it, an emotional response or behavioral response. The diencephalon is kind of that computer brain of sensory information. Once the diencephalon develops, then the brain puts uh, emphasis on the development of the limbic system. 
The limbic system develops between three and eight, and the limbic system is highly involved in your emotional states, your ability to self-regulate, social language, and your ability to interpret nonverbals. And then once all that's developed, like I said, the next thing that develops and the final thing that develops is your cortical area. It starts to organize and develop at eight uh, and is fully, you know, it's fully involved in that organization development process well into your uh, adult um, part of your life. Another good slide to think about is, is your, your brain is developing both hemispheres at, at, at the same time. However, there's preference over one hemisphere over the other based on what needs to happen next. And so in the, in the first two years of life, there's more preference or more need for the right hemisphere to develop. In the second two years of life, there's more preference and more need for the left hemisphere to develop. Then from there, in the next two years of life, we're back to right hemisphere. The next two years of life, we're back to the left hemisphere. And then eight, when you get to that magic number of eight or around that number of eight, there's an integration of development. Um, the brain, like I said, both parts of both hemispheres, of your brain are developing. There's just more emphasis on the organization and, and, and structure of one hemisphere over the other. They integrate in both hemispheres of your brain are developing at the same time, eight and after, because they both need to be developing for us to be able to develop those higher cognitive functions. You can't have it all be right hemisphere, or all left hemisphere. Both hemispheres have to be developing together so that you can develop that reasoning and rationalization and abstract ability that you need for your for your the age that's coming. And so just a good idea of, of kind of prioritization of hemispheres at different age um, spans. Other things to know. Um, when do things start to develop? What might be some of the critical periods, sensitive period stuff? Well, you've got your sensory pathways being developed early in life. Then you have your language pathways. And then, like I said er earlier, you have your higher cognitive functions being developed. And so think about it from the perspective of what happens, uh, what would happen if there was some kind of traumatic event that happened um, midway of your language development? Would it not affect language development? Or the same thing with what would happen if, if, you're, if something happened in the middle of your higher cognitive functioning development. Would it not affect the, the development of your ability to rationalize or reason? The thing about the brain that I showed earlier, you know, the whole idea of the brain developing bottom up is if the, if the brain has one area or one developmental period that is not met, if there's some kind of dysfunction, if there's some kind of uh, something that comes in to disrupt it, um, if it's not remediated, if we're not going to do something therapeutic, the next area of the brain is going to develop in a disorganized fashion as well. Oftentimes, the things that we see or that start to come out as mental or behavioral issues in young children, they actually have origins much earlier in life. They were just not identified and nothing therapeutic was done. So the brain is highly tied together. If, if your brainstem doesn't organize the way it should, then your diencephalon is not going to. And if your diencephalon doesn't organize the way it should, then your limbic system is not going to be organized the way it should. So it's a, it's a very tied together process that um, it occurs sequentially, but it, they, they must all develop to a normal state, whatever normal actually means, um, for them to all have the fully functioning abilities um, that we would have eventually as an adult. So what goes into this whole idea of development and regulation? Well, you know, we have all the individual stuff that goes in our, from our families. We have our relationships. We have culture. We have environment. We have genetics. The environmental influences is one of the biggest things that can have a negative or positive impact on our brain development, as well as attachment and relationships. And so when we think about someone who's developing, it's not just about you know the physical development, but also what what are all the influences that are affecting the individual and in their mental, physical, spir spiritual, social development. Uh, we are we are very tied tied to our environment, and environmental you know changes can easily impact how our brain is developing. So if you kind of the roots and origins of some of of, of behaviors, if you start to look at research and start to figure out where things come from, 
Um, if I, I, what I've got listed on some of the next slides are some common um, symptoms, symptoms that you see with a lot of different mental health issues. Um, dopamine is connected to aggression, irritability, hyperactivity, and problems with attention and motivation. Uh, norepinephrine is attached to your negative emotions. It's attached to your withdrawal, uh, desire to withdraw from situations. Uh, norepinephrine is also tied to the sensation of pain that's associated with depression. And so that gives you an idea of, of what neurotransmitter is involved in what behavior. Um, serotonin. Serotonin, we know serotonin is involved in um, uh, feelings of good, you know, not depressed, anti antidepressants, many of them work on serotonin. Well, serotonin is also involved in, a, in whether you are impulsive or not. Serotonin is involved in um, your appetite control. And if, you, if your serotonin levels are within normal range, you have a normal appetite. If they're out of balance, you may have a greater appetite or less of an appetite. So we know serotonin is, an, is one of the things related to depression, but it's also involved in many other things. Uh, the fourth category is uh, GABA, gamma amino butyric acid. Um, it's involved in a lot of different things, but it's not, its involvement is not direct. GABA is the inhibitory neurotransmitter that comes along to stop the dopamine or to stop norepinephrine or to stop um, uh, serotonin from being overactive. So GABA's effect on different mood states or different behaviors is from the perspective of being kind of the brake system and not the actual system that actually starts the, the reaction or whatever. So GABA is your, it's that, in that if you remember me talking about kind of that loop, it's in that place of it's the thing that's going to slow the other ones down. It's going to be your brakes. So to kind of take this a little bit further, so if dopamine's involved in aggression and all these other things, well, where is this happening? Well, it's happening in the limbic system. It's happening in the prefrontal cortex. That's where your dopamine and norepinephrine pathways project to. So motivation, if that's related to dopamine, well, where is that happening at? Well, that's happening in the striatum and the prefrontal cortex. Attention and hyperactivity, if that's related to dopamine and norepinephrine, where is that? That's going on in the lateral prefrontal cortex, the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex, the caudate and the putamen. All big words, not necessary to know, but if you, want, if you really want to know where something is working, like a medication, or if you're really wanting to know where anxiety comes from, what part of the brain that comes from, then this is the kind of stuff that you need to know. It, it's, it's, you know, anxiety is in this part of the brain and dope and depression are, are these parts of the brains. Uh, so it puts it all together. It puts it all together to the place of, of saying, well, if we're talking about attention and hyperactivity and we're talking about norepinephrine and dopamine, and we're talking about using a medication that works on these structures within the brain. That's, that's the, the, the fine tuning of things. You know, if we're talking about someone having difficulties with emotional regulation, they need a mood stabilizer. We're talking about, well, we need something that deals with dopamine or norepinephrine in the limbic system or the prefrontal cortex. And so it helps you kind of pinpoint where this might, you know, be working or, or giving the positive effect and also pinpoints where the symptoms are coming from. Impulsivity, that's your dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, your orbital frontal cortex, and your anterior cingulate cortex. All big words, but what, it, what does it do? It, it tells us where the symptoms are coming from. It tells us what neurotransmitters are involved, dopamine and serotonin. So what that would then do is eliminate, you know, which medications would be used to treat impulsivity. Uh, what works on dopamine, what works on serotonin. And then there's your GABA again. A lot we use, <clears throat> there are many medications that work on GABA just because GABA is, is the brakes. And so we kind of use the backdoor method of controlling um, neurotransmitters by doing something to affect GABA. Because GABA is going to slow down or have an, a, an inhibitory uh, effect on all the other neurotransmitters. So one of the biggest things that that complicates our ability to make sense of symptoms is stress. Um, 
under stress, we can have the symptoms of many things. Um, stress in, you know, in moderate levels can make us look really inattentive. It can make us look very hyperactive. It can, it can make us look depressed. Stress in toxic levels can make us look like we have personality disorders. It can make us look like we have um, you know, something, something chronic like schizophrenia. Stress itself um, and the effects of stress on the body and the brain can mimic the symptoms of many, diag many other mental health diagnoses. And so uh, in that kind of rule out situation, one of the best things to do when you're working with someone is look at all of their history, you know, look at their current situation, look at um, their recent events. Um, do the recent events explain their current symptoms or, or is this something that's long-term? Could this be something that's actual chemical? Um, a lot of stress, a lot of, uh, of, of trauma says look deeper. Uh, a lot of stress in the last you know, five months would be a really good indicator that even though their symptoms say they're this, they might actually be something else. And so I like to bring in stress because stress is, um, is a really good confound to confuse us and our diagnostic abilities, especially, I just talked about the positive and, and tolerable and toxic stress, especially when you see this slide. Um, stress um, creates a futile cycle within the body and the brain to where um, cytokine is released. Uh, cytokine is an inflammatory factor. Um, stress itself and that release of cytokine uh, then causes this trickle-down effect where you have a lot of symptoms that may mimic other mental health issues, but it's actually related to the stress, the trauma, the abuse the negative events themselves, a lot of different things. Uh, a lot of what we see that, that relates to trauma and abuse and, and neglect and uh, relate to how cytokine actually causes inflammation. The inflammation then causes uh, damage to the brain. And so you can see all the different places where cytokine has effect. It has an effect on anxiety and fear. It has an effect on your your fear-related response and, and the whole idea of PTSD and the amygdala. Uh, it causes cognitive impairments. It reduces neural or neurogenesis, uh, which in, in itself can limit the plasticity of the brain or the ability for your brain to kind of bounce back from a situation. So a lot of, a lot of symptoms can come from just the inflammation that comes about as a result of stress. Um, that's why I always tell my students is, yeah, you've got symptoms in front of you. They're, they're, you know, your client is displaying symptoms. They're talking about symptoms, uh, but go deeper, find out about these symptoms. You know, are these symptoms related to events? Are they related to what happened in the last six months? Or are these kind of long-term symptoms? They've always had this depressiveness or is this depressiveness just due to life experiences that occurred in the last six months? And so, um, I think stress and the effects of stress complicate our, our di diagnostic ability a lot. And, and, and oftentimes we don't look deep enough to understand what our clients are, are actually displaying or telling us about. So in the idea of understanding psychopharmacology, you've got to understand some specific uh, principles. Um, the first one is here. Um, I just jumped over. ADME. So the whole idea of pharmacokinetics. So what does this mean? Absorption of the medication, distribution of the medication throughout your body, um, metabolism of the medication, and then excretion of your medication. So why is this important? Pharmacokinetics, uh, basically that's the physics of medications and how they work their way in and out of the body. Um, some medications have different absorption rates. Some have different distribution rates. Some are metabolized by the liver. Some are metabolized by the kidneys. And so uh, that's one of the things that has to be taken into consideration when understanding how someone is benefiting or maybe not benefiting from a medication. Um, uh, part of the whole absorption thing is some medications have to be taken with food. Some medications have to be taken on empty stomach. Some of the information that clients are not always getting, they're just being told, take this medication, take it in the morning, take it at night, 
they're not being given all the, the, the specifics around it. And so it's helpful to understand, you know, is this a medication that should be taken on empty stomach? Is this a medication that's going to make this person drowsy? So it might actually be better for them to take it at night. Um, another thing that affects the whole idea of distribution is fat content, fat content in a body, fat content in meals. And so some medications are highly fat bound and some are highly water bound. And so um, it's one of those things of, you know, if a person is not getting uh, the effect of a medication um, that they should after they've been on it for X period, of, you know, X number of weeks and things like that, the question is, is, you know, tell me more about your medication. I can tell you that the average doctor or pharmacist is not sitting around asking their their patients, you know, tell me about when you're taking your medication. Are you taking them or are you taking them with food, without food? You know, what are you eating? What are you drinking? And so, you know, sometimes I think we are the, the best uh, ones to ask these questions because we spend more time with our clients. We don't spend five minutes or 15 minutes with them. We spend 45 minutes to an hour with them. So we're in that place of really helping to understand the whole thing of medication and how it's you know, working or not working. And so um, you need to understand a little bit about pharmacokinetics. The next thing that you need to understand is a little bit about pharmacodynamics. And pharmacodynamics is the whole idea of you got the medication in your body, it's absorbed, it's at the, the neuron. So where is it affecting it? Is it affecting, is it gonna have its impact on mood, behavior, you know, whatever, is it going to have the impact at a receptor? Is it going to have it on an enzyme? Is it going to have it by activating or, or deactivating an ion channel? Is it going to have an impact on the immune system? And so that's some of that finite little minutia stuff about medications and understanding how they work. Um, do you understand how they, or can you understand how the medications are actually working at the receptor or ion channel? or preventing an enzyme from chewing up a neurotransmitter. So pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics are two important parts of psychopharmacology. So your basic neurotransmitters, uh, acetylcholine, it was the first neurotransmitter basically um, discovered more than 100 years ago, probably close to 125 years ago. Even though it's the first to be discovered, it's one of the ones we still know the least about. It's kind of interesting. It's, it's involved in a lot of things like movement. Um, it's involved in learning and memory. Acetylcholine is one of the neurotransmitters <clears throat> that's involved or, or its lack of involvement uh, is kind of the source of some of the memory deficits that go along with Alzheimer's disease. So it's very involved in a lot of things. It's just in many ways, we still don't understand all the things that there are to know about acetylcholine. Norepinephrine, um, it's a stimulant. Think about it from that perspective. It excites things. It gives you your alertness, your wakefulness, and your arousal. Um, it, it's, um, it's been around. We understand it pretty well. We know where it is within the body and the brain. We know what affects it and what doesn't affect it. Um, just like with dopamine, we understand dopamine really well. It's also involved in muscle movement, emotions, learning and attention. It's involved in the, um, the whole idea of being addicted to something. The dopamine, the hypothesis of addiction is a, is a big understanding of, of how dopamine is involved in kind of that getting you hooked on something. Serotonin, we, we know it's involved in memory, emotions, wakefulness, your sleep, your hunger, your temperature regulation. It's involved in a lot of different things. Um, we primarily study it and look at serotonin from the perspective of uh, serotonin's involvement in depression. A um, little bit of looking at serotonin and its involvement in anxiety and OCD, but not so much as with the depression part. GABA, um, primary use of GABA or the, how we look at it um, in the idea is mood, not so much motor behavior, but mood benzodiazepines that are used to treat anxiety um, uh, work on GABA. And so GABA is, is primarily in, in the mental health world looked at from the perspective of 
of, of mood regulation or, or something like that, especially with anxiety, also with seizure disorders, but that's not so much of a mental health issue. Glutamate, um, probably the last to be discovered, um, but the, the source of a lot of research in the last 10 years. Um, glutamate, um, old name for glutamate was glutamic acid. So if you're reading articles, you'll either see it show up as glutamic acid or you'll see it show up as glutamate. Um, the interesting thing about glutamate um, is that if you could take all of the neurotransmitters out of somebody's brain and weigh them individually, you would find that glutamate makes up 75% of the weight of all neurotransmitters. So if you think about that, if 75% of all your neurotransmitters in your brain is actually glutamate, it must be very important. Uh, and, and that has spurred a lot of research over the last few years. Uh, there's a lot of different medications coming out that work on glutamate in some way or another to affect things from, from substance use disorders to um, seizure disorders to depression. And so um, glutamate is very important, and we're beginning to understand it better than, than we have in the past. Glycine, we've known about for a very long time, not much research around it, just because for the moment, it looks like it's more involved in, in spinal reflexes and motor behavior and not so much involved in mental health issues. And there's those neuromodulators that uh, I was mentioning earlier. There's a lot of neuromodulators. I mentioned um, hormones being neuromodulators. There's a lot of other ones that are involved in a lot of sensory transmission. Um, some of the earliest to be studied were neuromodulators for the whole idea of the feeling of pain. And so neuromodulators are there to act between, as a bridge between uh, your neurotransmitters and the effects that they actually produce. So if you break your neurotransmitters down into two different categories, excitatory and inhibitory, you'll see that most of the neurotransmitters are excitatory and only GABA and glycine are inhibitory. So excitatory doesn't mean it necessarily excites something. Excitatory means it initiates something. The, the, the word better there would be not excitatory, but to initiate something. These are neurotransmitters that initiate something. Inhibitory is pretty right with GABA and glycine. It, it stops it and it, it inhibits something. But excitatory sounds like you're going to make it happen or exciting. Excitatory can actually just be it initiates it. It starts a process versus stopping a process. Um, you'll see some of these that I didn't even mention in here. It's just because we don't think about these in terms of mental health. Here's histamine. You know about histamine. You know, you take antihistamines when you have allergy issues. Epinephrine known about it for a very long time. Epinephrine is involved in cardiac function. We don't really think about it much in mental health function. Aspartate, um, more or less kind of the, the whole idea of amino acid, um, not much studied all around it and the whole idea of, you know, how is it involved in, in neurotransmitters. Um, what you should realize is that aspartate looks very much like something that's very common in a lot of uh, uh, Calorie-free sodas, aspartate is very similar to aspartame. Uh, aspartame itself, as a non-calorie sweetener, actually stimulates you, and that's the reason why we like our Diet Cokes and Diet Pepsis is because it's actually a little bit of a stimulant in there. So aspartate uh, is very similar to that. Like I said, we don't study it for mental health, or they're not studying it yet for mental health. Many different ways to transmit um, neurotransmitters. You'll this is a we don't have to go through all this. You'll have the slides and you can see it, but if you notice here, there are about 11 different ways or places that a medication could actually interact with a neuron to produce an effect that's necessary. So um, if you think about selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, where are they doing that? Well, they're, they're, they may be blocking a pump that's on this neuron. Uh, so that the serotonin stays around here in the synapse longer. Um, they may be blocking a receptor over here or, or up here that's going to take it back up so that it stays around in the synapse longer. So there's, there's a lot of, of places that 
medications can actually interact with the, the kind of what we call the terminal end or the terminal button of a neuron to actually bring about the um, effects of the medication. Just a bigger you know, picture of the, of the synapse and what's all involved. And you see there's many different places that we can interact here on the, on the synapse. One of the things I also like to, to remind everybody or to kind of bring up is, is to have neurotransmitters, you have to have proper nutrition. Um, you can't eat um, cake and potato chips all day long and think that you're going to have the, the right neurotransmitters or the right concentrations of neurotransmitters. And so um, the nutrition of an in individual really does impact their body's ability to have the, the things it needs to build neurotransmitters. There's a really good list of all the neurotransmitters here and what's necessary for the body and the brain to make them. Um, a lot of them you'll see are vitamins, a lot of them are B vitamins. Um, and, and, you, and more or less, if, you're, if you don't have the right concentrations of these you know, vitamins, minerals, um, metals within the body, then your body doesn't have the ability to make the neurotransmitter. So when I teach psychopharmacology, I try to teach it from two different perspectives. Um, you probably already realize that there's a lot of complex stuff in psychopharmacology. Most of it you don't really need to know. What you need to know is where it's affecting the brain, and how it's affecting the brain. So when I teach psychopharmacology in all of my psychopharmacology classes, the assignments are based on the next two things I'm gonna show you. Um, assignment one is I give you a medication and give you a disorder that the medication is used to treat. And I say visually describe how the medication is treating blank. And so the goal is can you visualize how the medication is working and where it's working. Uh, when you go to explain something to a client, if you visualize it for them, it will be easier to understand. And so what I'm visualizing here is uh, the feelings and avoidance associated with anxiety. And basically over here is benzodiazepine, a benzodiazepine that's used to treat anxiety. And so if you can put together visuals, if you can take that complex terminology and make it visual, it's easier for you to understand and it will be easier for clients to understand. I can understand that my anxiety occurs at certain places in my brain and the medication I take actually does something on this thing they call a receptor or on a channel and that helps my anxiety. And so visually describing the medication, um, it's, it's fun, it's frustrating, um, but it's, it brings creativity into the whole idea of making sense of medication. So if you, can, if you can visualize it in your head, you know, what is it, where is it working, what's it affecting, then you'll have a much better opportunity or be much more likely to be able to describe it to a client. Um, if you look at any of the research out there about, you know, describing complex things to clients, patients, um, most of the information out there says if you can take the information and break it down to where a third grader would understand it, most people will understand it. And so there's a lot of great information out there. One of the one of the good websites is called Plain Language, and, and it teaches you how to take complex things and break it down to a place that you can explain it to the place that a third grader would understand it. And so it's one of the things I like to do is when I do this assignment is, can you explain it with as few words as possible, relying primarily on visuals? And the other thing to, to so that you can gather the information um, that's really necessary to know about a medication is I do this assignment called the medication checklist. And what you see here is an example of an entry into a medication checklist. You know, what do you need to know about a medication? The brand name, the generic name, what classification of medication is it in? You know, what is it used to treat? What's its indications? What disorders? What are the doses of the medication uh, by age? Because some, do some medications have doses 
that go all the way down to, you know, four years of age, all the way up to 65 years of age. And so what is the necessary dose by age? How does it work? What's the mechanism of action? What are the, the most common side effects? Then one of the things uh, is what, what else is it used for that it's not actually approved to be used for? Um, there's a lot of medications that are used for mental health issues that aren't approved for mental health treatment. Uh, there's a lot of medications that are approved to treat certain mental health issues, but they're also used to treat other mental health issues that are not, they haven't sought the approval for. Uh, it's really common to see someone on blank medication to treat so-and-so, and it's never been tested or approved in it um, by the FDA. So, you know, what are the unapproved uses? What are we call the off-label uses? And then how do you support this? What are your references? Um, the best two references that I like on the internet that have very comprehensive, very um, detailed, accurate information. Uh, one is drugs.com and the other one is RxList. Those are my favorite two. Those are the ones that give me the most information. Uh, they have very reliable information on them much more reliable than resources like the physician's desk reference and things like that. Um, I, I rely on those two a lot um, because the other references, the other things that we could use to make sense of this, um, those, those resources are very expensive. Um, at the end of the PowerPoint, you'll see, and you'll, we'll have this PowerPoint, you'll see the if you had a lot of money and you wanted to spend it on the best two references, the best two references out there is, is one called Up to Date and the other one is called Facts and Comparison. Um, we use them in pharmacy a lot, but they're written to anybody can understand them. I think a, a subscription, a one-year subscription to Up to Date is about $800 a year, and a one-year subscription to Facts and Comparison is about $500 a year. So they're not exactly the things that we're all reaching out to buy because they cost too much. Well, if you if you can't use them, use RxList and Drugs.com. They uh, they're they're pretty simple and easy to navigate and give you the idea of of what you need to know. Um, so what this does, this is you know if you take this example of this assignment and you start teaching yourself about psychopharmacology, the the um, this gives you all the technical information to help understand it, and then the whole visual that you created, like I showed you in the last slide gives you the, the the visual part of it. You know, how do you put these two together to make sense of the medication to, you know, describe it to your client? Um, how do you, I think of all the technical information that's represented here, this gives you the ability to talk to the client's, you know, physician about it, their prescriber about it. Um, it gives you the, the technical knowledge to be able to to communicate with a different population, the, the, the ones who, you know, who communicate in a technical fashion. So as we get into the different neurotransmitters, you'll see a, a lot of brain images. Um, I wish these images were still available. I've had them for about 10 years. Um, there's a really good um, website uh, called CNS Forum. Um, basically, they had these images available for a long time and they've updated them. I don't actually like what they updated them to, so I just keep using the old images because they look better. They, they, they describe things better. Um, if you can find them, like I said, they come from CNS Forum, which is part of an um, institute called the Lundbeck Institute, and they have really good free information, really good uh, PowerPoints on different medications and the treatment of different disorders, you'll see those references in the uh, reference section. So if we start to go through the different neurotransmitters, figure out where they come from, where they project to, we start to understand what they're involved in. And so the first one we'll start with is uh, dopamine. Dopamine uh, comes from cell bodies within the kind of the midbrain here. Um, basically, it comes from the substantia nigra and the ventral tegmental area. And so that's your little body right here. That's the cell body. It produces this neurotransmitter. The neurotransmitter pathways that lead out of it lead to two different places. One that leads up into the limbic system and one that leads up into the prefrontal cortex. The one that leads up into the limbic system is involved in emotional regulation. Uh, you know, if it's overactive, then you get the aggression and things like that. 
the one that projects up into the prefrontal cortex could be involved in motivation or focus and attention like you see um, that's missing in ADHD. So that's dopamine. Dopamine has a lot of different subtypes, receptor subtypes. It's in, it's in, if you get down to that minutia of things, you'll see all the different things that dopamine's involved in. Um, the thing to know about dopamine is dopamine exists in kind of a balance with acetylcholine. It's called your extrapyramidal system. Um, basically, the goal within your, your brain is to keep those in balance. If you if they get out of balance, you get different symptoms. And so if dopamine levels are too high, you get psychosis. If dopamine levels are too low, you get movement disorders. If acetylcholine levels are too high, you get uh, tics. And if, if acetylcholine levels are too low, um, you get things like um, you, you have memory deficits and things like that. One of the things I forgot to mention about dopamine also is dopamine levels get too low. You also have symptoms that are similar or consistent with Parkinson's disease. And so they're connected. As acetylcholine goes up, dopamine goes down. As dopamine goes up, acetylcholine goes down. So they go in this kind of extra pyramidal system trying to stay in balance. Uh, and like I said, at each level, they produce symptoms of different things. Your next would be serotonin. Um, serotonin comes from a couple of bodies, one down here, kind of going down your spinal column, really close to the brain stem. That's your colorophi nuclei, and the other was the rostrorophi nuclei. And you'll see that they have projections, one into the cerebellum, both of those do. The other one, the, the rostrorophi nuclei, it has a projection or a neurotransmitter pathway that completely covers your cortex, you know, the everything. Um, if it's going into your cerebellum, it might be involved in something like memory or something like that movement. If the projection of the neurotransmitter that's going up into your cortex, that's involved in things like depression. It's involved in things like impulse control. So different projections do different things. Same neurotransmitter, different things. Uh, one of the things to note about this is when you take a medication that works on serotonin, we are not good enough to be selective enough for the medication to only work in one place. And so if, if a medication is taken to work on serotonin because we're depressed, it's not only going to affect serotonin in this pathway, it's going to affect serotonin in these pathways. Um, I hope in, in my lifetime that we will get to the place where medications can be very specific, uh, like chemotherapy is now. We can target chemotherapy to very specific areas of the body and brain. Um, we're not there with medication yet. We're getting there. We're not there yet. So right now, more or less, it's kind of a shotgun approach. You take something that works on serotonin, it's going to work on serotonin wherever serotonin is. Um, if we can be more selective about where the medication works, we can reduce the number of side effects an individual would actually experience. Here's all the different um, subtypes of serotonin receptors. Um, I remember very well, and, and when I was graduating from, from pharmacy school 32 years ago, um, serotonin was the new big thing. It's, you know, the first selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor had just come out. That's the antidepressant Prozac. And back 32 years ago, we knew about 5-HT1A and 5-HT1B. All the other has been discovered since. And you'll see all the different places that serotonin and all the different things that serotonin is involved in, like vomiting, anxiety, um, stomach pains, many different places that serotonin is involved. Um, here's, here's one of the original ones. And we knew that serotonin was useful in the treatment of anxiety. Uh, we knew that serotonin was useful in the treatment of sleep disorders uh, because we knew something about this subtype of a receptor. Next neurotransmitter that, that I would uh, talk about is norepinephrine. Um, comes from two different cell bodies, the locus ceruleus, and there's a word you'll remember from just a minute ago, the caudal rafi nuclei. Uh, projections down into the cerebellum and all up into the, the cortex. Um, the locus ceruleus is the, the main thing that we talk about with norepinephrine. 
Um, if you look at research on anxiety, uh, you'll see the locus ceruleus is mentioned a lot. You'll see that norepinephrine is mentioned a lot. And so the whole idea of norepinephrine coming from this cell body is more important or is, is much more referred to than norepinephrine and its effects coming from the caudal rafi nuclei. So we look at norepinephrine and its effect a little bit on the, the, the uh, limbic system, the cerebellum, but mainly on the cortex. Um, in the old days, the first antidepressants worked on norepinephrine. So we were trying to treat depression in the cortex with something that affected the levels of norepinephrine. Um, we treat anxiety that originates in the locus ceruleus with GABA, something that works on GABA because it puts a brakes, the brakes on norepinephrine. It doesn't do anything specifically directly to norepinephrine. It just slows down norepinephrine. Gamma immunobutyric acid. So GABA, you'll see it's all over the place. It really doesn't have any specific cell bodies. All these little dots are places that make GABA. Um, until you know, 10 or 15 years ago, um, everybody was calling GABA kind of the master of all neurotransmitters because it does, you know, stop the action of other neurotransmitters. Um, you see, it's all over the the uh, cortex, a little bit in the cerebellum lot here in the limbic area, the midbrain area, especially having an effect on the, the olfactory bulb and hippocampus. Um, but GABA, like I have been saying all, uh, you know, all the time, is GABA is not a direct effect. It's an inhibitory effect. And so think about norepinephrine coming out of the locus ceruleus and it's producing anxiety. We take a medication that works on GABA because GABA slows down the activity of norepinephrine. And glutamate, uh, glutamate is the one I mentioned earlier ago. If you could weigh it, weigh 70, it's 75 percent of the neurotransmitters in your brain. Um, basically, in, in more recent research, um, why everybody's looking at glutamate now is because if you look at this diagram, you see glutamate pathways kind of encircle or surround everything. So they're highly involved in all other neurotransmitter systems. And if you can have an impact on glutamate, you can have an impact on all neurotransmitter systems, including GABA. Um, it, is, it is truly kind of the master of all neurotransmitters in its ability to control other neurotransmitter systems and you know, produce or reduce symptoms. GABA itself, many different um, receptor types see what it's all involved in um, you can see how it may be uh, connected to different disorders like memory and learning disruption anxiety fatigue sedation depression induced by stress uh, eating disorders alcohol abuse many different things where is it at you know here's your brain region and which GABA receptors involved here it, it actually shows you the different receptors um, that GABA is involved in Acetylcholine, um, like I said, it was the first to be um, discovered a long time ago, but still the one that's the most, um, you know, confusing or maybe misunderstood and to the point that if you look at the neurotransmitter pathways that are represented here, they're represented with dotted lines instead of what you've seen in other images because we think this is how it works and where it works, but we are still unsure. Um, acetylcholine is kind of elusive. Um, it, it's uh, a long time ago in Alzheimer's research, some of the first things they said about Alzheimer's and was that um, for some reason, the acetylcholine producing cell bodies within the brain died. The brain stopped having uh, the necessary amount of acetylcholine, so we get dementia. Well, that kind of rocked on for a very long time as kind of a theory. Um, until until we get to the place of um, deep brain stimulation coming around. And basically with deep brain stimulation, um, what research has shown is the acetylcholine producing cell bodies did not die, they went to sleep. And so with um, deep brain stimulation, you can turn them back on, the cell bodies start to release acetylcholine again, and then some of the deficits in memory, uh, the whole dementia part of it starts to clear up. 
the problem with that is here's the the kind of the 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 elusivity of of acetylcholine as soon as you do anything to increase the level of acetylcholine your body does something to destroy whatever comes out so for some reason you know our brain doesn't want us to to tamper with acetylcholine we do something to increase its levels the the you know the brain kicks in the enzyme that chews it up we do something to affect the the enzyme that chews up acetylcholine the brain does something else to destroy it so that's why acetylcholine is so elusive is that every time we try to do anything to it to make it function better make it more you know more levels of it around have more of it around to be bioactive the brain does something to get rid of the excess and so by doing anything that stimulates acetylcholine the brain sees that as a foreign action and the brain is going to do something to counter that action and that's that's the the kind of the the uniqueness of acetylcholine um, if you start looking through research, you'll find there's a lot of research on a lot of different medications. Um, some of the research goes down as far as use of medication as early as six months of age. Um, primarily things like diazepam, which is for seizure disorders in that young of an age of an individual. Um, all the way up, you know, you'll start to see you know, things like um, seizure medications that are used for mood stabilization of two-year-olds and go on and on and on. Um, there's a lot still that has not been, you know, if you look at these, the list of medications here, this is very a small list of medications that have actual research. Um, you know, if you look at what's listed in these medications here, this is less than 25% of the medications that are on the market to be used for mental health. And so a lot out there that's not clear as to how it actually works or um, if it's, you know, going to cause any long-term damage. When you start to regulate mood, um, and this kind of brings us into the different medications, know that mood regulation involves three neurotransmitters, norepinephrine, serotonin, and dopamine. Uh, they're all involved in some piece or part of mood regulation. Um, in this Venn diagram, you'll see there are different pieces and parts. And right here in the middle is mood. Um, serotonin's got a part in it, norepinephrine's got a part in it, and so does dopamine. Um, however, if you use a medication that works on all three at one time, you get side effects that are unbearable sometimes. And so mood regulation, what does that mean? Well, there's a lot of ways and reasons to regulate mood. If you think about regulating someone's mood when they're anxious or regulating someone's mood when they're depressed or when they're bipolar or schizophrenic, they all mean different things and are treated different ways. They're all in a way we're doing something to regulate mood uh, we're maybe we're using a medication that works on norepinephrine but because these three are connected together by affecting norepinephrine you're also going to affect serotonin and dopamine so highly tied together um, reference down here is old as dirt it's 20 years old 21 years old but one of the best references ever to be produced i think it's probably in about its 10th uh, edition now, but if you want to read something that's dense but very good, read Essential Psychopharmacology, Neuroscientific Basis and Practical Applications. Uh, Stephen Stahl's work and writings, he's kind of like the, the, the best of the best. Um, when, I was in, when I was in pharmacy school, we kind of, we referred to um, this, the, the first edition of this book is the Bible of Psychopharmacology because it was so well respected. And so um, I know that there are much newer editions out of this uh, than this one from 2000, but 2000 is the one that I have, so I referenced it. Um, once again, kind of here in the idea of there are a lot of different disorders that have similar symptoms, and oftentimes these symptoms kind of come together like you see in this Venn diagram. And so, you know, when you're working on ADHD, you know, you might, you know, are you working on mood regulation? Are you working on attention, focus, hyperactivity? How does that relate to an affective disorder, PTSD or OCD? So it's not so much about, it's not just about, um, I'm uh, doing something to affect ADHD, the, the impulsivity associated with ADHD, realize that when you do that, then you affect something else. And so the whole point of this diagram is to say, it's all connected together. 
and the side effects that come out of use of treating something comes from the fact that everything is connected together. So I think this is a really good place to stop. It's about um, 3.30, your, or almost 3.25 your time, but this is a really good place to stop for a 15 minute break because we're about to jump off in the different specific medications and that would be better done after the break than it would be to start it and then stop it and start it back again. So I think we can stop for a break now. All right, so we'll see everybody back in about 15 minutes. You can stay logged in, just turn off your yep. cameras and your mic. And then Frank, if you want to just email me, the program, I, will. I will get that set up. I will do that right now. This has been amazing. I am well, loving thank you. this. Thank you. And so, yeah, it could, it could easily, it could be, it may not be, we might not be treating the right thing, but it could be just as beneficial to use it. Yes. Okay. The other question I had is you mentioned that a lot of these medications have not been tested in children in terms of brain development and how it might affect that. Are there suspicions that like, what, what kind of damage would it possibly do? Like what are suspicions of detrimental impact on brain development from psycho, psycho meds? So the, the main thing that we know just because we know what, a lot about brain development is a lot of the areas of the brain and the function of the brain is neurotransmitter dependent. And so if you did something to deplete the neurotransmitter or block a neurotransmitter, you wouldn't have that area of the brain develop the way it should. <clears throat> and so it's, it's that kind of thing is, you know, what is the medication doing? Is it preventing something that should be there for the natural occurrence or the natural development of something to occur. Um, <clears throat> there are a couple of studies out there that are finally kind of trickling out um, uh, about long-term effects of certain medication classes. One is a very positive outcome for, for one thing and one is a very negative outcome. And so I'll mention these again when we get to the medications, but um, there have been some long-term studies on the use of ADHD medication uh, across brain development. And basically, all, all evidence is pointing to long-term use of ADHD medication across different developmental stages of the brain has no impact on brain development. So it's positive. Uh, the one that's very negative is the use of atypical antipsychotics for the treatment of mood stabilization or aggression in children. Basically, the long term, basically what's coming out of the research about them is they create uh, chemical brain damage and actually prevent brain, parts of the brain developing the way it should because of the neurotransmitters that they're blocking. And so that's the only two long term studies I've seen of uh, that relate to different medications over, you know, across kind of a lifespan or, or, or many different developmental stages of brain development. Um, one's positive and one's negative. That's interesting. What about something like an SSRI where it's, you know, allowing the, making the reuptake, you know, like how it's inhibiting the reuptake or whatever, like it's not necessarily blocking it. It's just allowing it like something like that going to damage. It could have potential to damage. It has the potential to damage, but what it has, what it most likely does in the short term effect is in a developing brain, neurotransmitters have um, the outcome of neurotransmitters is different in a child brain than an adult brain. They have a different reaction. And so increasing serotonin in a child's brain is going to make him impulsive. If you increase serotonin in an adult brain, it curbs their impulsivity. So it's a reverse effect. Thank you. That's fascinating. Yeah, it's it's basically it's it's kind of this thing of there's a lot of things that are that in, in an adult it does this and it does the opposite thing in a child. And that's just because the brain is not fully developed. And one of the easiest ones is is you know, you want to make a child more impulsive, put them on an SSRI. You want to make a, an adult less impulsive, put them on an SSRI. So it, it's it's kind of the opposite effect. It's like you know, uh, some kids get very hyper when they take Benadryl, 
Uh, and, you know, most adults get very sleepy when they take Benadryl. And so it's, it's that idea of the brain is not developed. So more or less the neurotransmitter being affected does an opposite thing or does a different thing in the developing brain, brain versus the developed brain. And so I think that's one of the things that makes it really hard to study is because it is you're, you're, how do you get all these people to be involved in a longitudinal study across, you know, from six years of age till 24 to have enough to actually make sense of it, you know, is, is there a long-term impact of it or is there really nothing at all? I mean, it was easy to study the ADHD medications because they were so commonly used. And it's now easy to study atypical antipsychotics because they're so commonly used in children now. So, Thank you, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. I think we're good to go, Frank, so whenever you're ready. All right. So we'll get started back where we left off in, in kind of the first um, category of medications and, and disorders that we'll talk about um, have to do with anxiety. Are you recording? I am. Okay. I didn't see I didn't see the little flashing thing, and I wanted to make sure it was going. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, all right. So this is a great image of anxiety. This didn't come out of a medical journal or anything like that. I mean, this this was one of the best ones I ever saw. It's t almost 20 years old now. This came out of Time magazine. And so it really is a good visual of of anxiety, where it's going on, what's involved within the brain. And it's it's even good to the point of, of basically sh showing you there's a high road to anxiety and a low road to anxiety. It's there, you can't get much better than this image in the fact that it, it talks about the, the different types of anxiety and it talks about all of the different parts of the brain that's involved in anxiety. Um, it, it's, it's, uh, here's that locus ceruleus that I was talking about, kind of the, you'll see it's this little red dot here. It's the source of norepinephrine, but it's kind of the, 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 the center of anxiety. Um, so great visuals there. Um, so you you remember this slide from a minute ago, GABA, um, medications that work on GABA, um, that do something to increase the level of GABA or better functioning of GABA are the ones that are best used to treat anxiety, um, in the short term. So benzodiazepines are really good to treat anxiety in the short term. If you want to treat anxiety over a longer period of time, it would be better to use something like an SSRI, uh, just because of, of side effect profiles, addiction, addiction potentials with benzodiazepines and things. And so, um, if you were to look at medications, you know, their prescribing kind of limitations and things like that, you will see that most benzodiazepines say that this is intended for use for six weeks or less, but things like uh, SSRIs can be much longer term. And so the, the treatment of anxiety, if medications were necessary, um, it would be best to start with a benzodiazepine and an SSRI at the same time. By the time the SSRI has time to have an effect, you start to wean them off the benzodiazepine. And so you get, the, you get a quick effect, the acute effect from the benzodiazepine and then you get the long-term effect from the SSRI. Um, basically, the you know the top anti-anxiety agents that are out there on the market been out there for a very long time: Valium, Ativan, Clonopin, and Xanax. Um, Clonopin um, was used primarily, you know, in its early days for seizures, status epilepticus, but it's really good for anxiety. It's really good for um, kind of you know taking the edge off of anxiety and panic really quickly while something else can be coming up to the right level to have the effect. And so that's the thing about this is, you know, when you see someone, are they on medication for anxiety? Are they on something, you know, that's really intended for short-term use? Or are they on something that's intended for the long haul? Um, benzodiazepines are actually intended for the short haul, not for the long haul. Um, the longer you're on a benzodiazepine, the more memory deficits you have and the more likely you become physically dependent to it because they're all controlled substances. 
And so your body becomes dependent on the effect of the medication, not, not also, you know, the feeling the medication can produce. Um, so, you know, the, the goal would be to, if, you know, if you're working with someone, they need to be referred for medication. The best case scenario would be they're put on a benzodiazepine and a, an SSRI at the same time so that they get the acute effect of the benzodiazepine they they get that relief quickly uh, while the SSRI is having the the, the opportunity to take effect. Uh, SSRIs take take from two to six weeks to have an effectiveness, and so they're a little bit slower. Uh, it's kind of hard when someone has a lot of anxiety or panic to to just tell them, you know, well in six weeks this will be better because your medication will be working. And so that's not a rational choice. The rational choice would be a short acting medication and a long acting medication with the short acting medication being removed when the long acting medication um, has the ability to, to pr produce the, the effects you want. So what are some of the side effects of benzodiazepines? They make you sleepy, they make you dizzy, they can make you irritable, they can make you unsteady, they can cause problems with confusion and memory problems. Um, you know, in higher levels, they're addictive. Um, benzodiazepines are all um, class four medications, uh, schedule four medications in that uh, in, in medications, they have the scheduling of medications goes from one to five. Uh, number one is a, a street drug. Number two, uh, schedule two narcotic is something that's more or less the, the strongest thing that you can have that's still legal by prescription. And schedule five is kind of the least addictive. Benzodiazepines are fours, and so they have addiction potential, um, and they, and it has to be watched. I mean, you you this is definitely a class of medication that a person really shouldn't be on long term, and, and if they are, are on it long term, you have to worry about the withdrawal potential when they're when they're taken off of it. So the withdrawal or the you know taking them off the medication has to be done kind of gradually over time, so that the body and the brain has a, a chance to come back up to speed on its natural self. It has the ability to kind of take back over control what the, what the benzodiazepine has been controlling. Um, serotonin in the treatment of anxiety, the basically the only real medication that works on serotonin that was ever created for anxiety is Buspar. It works very well, but it doesn't work quickly. It takes four to six weeks for it to work. So in the short term, you know, there's that there's this need for short short term effectiveness, the benzodiazepine, while Buspar is having the opportunity to, you know, come up to the effective levels and help control anxiety and things like that. So um, that's the only one of the SSRIs that was actually ever created for anxiety. Many of the other ones are used for anxiety, but they weren't necessarily created for it. There's also some miscellaneous things out there that's been around for a very long time. Uh, Atarax and Vistaril were created for anxiety. They are absolutely worthless for anxiety. Atarax is really good if you have poison ivy and you're itching, and Vistaril is really good if you're nauseated uh, for some reason. So they're not really good for anxiety. They they were used in the first you know probably few years that they were actually on the market for anxiety, but they have virtually no effectiveness for the treatment of anxiety. They have very good effectiveness for something else. Um, side effects with Buspar and Atarax and Vistaril, very similar to the side effects that you see with um, the benzodiazepines, confusion, dizziness, drowsiness. One of the things that's very uh, unique about anything that works on serotonin, they disinhibit you. So basically, they, they more or less think about you have a mental inhibition to prevent you from acting on your impulses uh, SSRIs or things that work on serotonin can remove or, or kind of diminish your disinhibition ability. And so you uh, think about it like this, you know, you have an impulse, you're more likely to act on it because you have no longer, you no longer have your disin disinhibition mechanism in place. Um, down here with Atarax and Vistaril, the reason why they cause sedation and blurred vision is Atarax and Vistaril actually work on acetylcholine and histamine really well. So they have some of the same effects as an antihistamine. They can cause dry mouth. They can cause sedation, blurred vision because they're working on histamine as well. So 
Um, they're, they're unique, they're still around, uh, but you don't see them used for anxiety. Um, good image about depression, you know, what's involved in, the, in depression? Well, you see here many different areas of the brain involved in depression. Uh, from the prefrontal cortex to the insular cortex and the hippocampus, the amygdala, nucleus accumbens. Um, and I like to put, go ahead and put this in here because we treat OCD with SSRIs. And so you'll notice here, even though they are very unrelated, depression and OCD, some of the same areas um, that are kind of the source of depression and OCD are similar. Here's your nucleus accumbens again. Here's your frontal cortex. Um, different things, different symptoms coming from similar areas in the brain. You can treat them with the same medication, uh, but they are very unrelated disorders. Um, if you think about it from the DSM-5 perspective, OCD uh, used to be considered part of the anxiety cluster. Now it's on its own it's never been considered to be part of the depression kind of spectrum of things. But yes, there are some similar areas in the brain that, that are, are the source of the occurrence of OCD and depression. So what medications? If you, I mentioned this earlier, if you, if you look back at the old antidepressants, you see that they were all working on norepinephrine. Uh, the tricyclic antidepressants, they were all working on norepinephrine. We knew, long time ago that norepinephrine would stimulate the brain and, and more or less motivate the brain. And so it had the ability to lift the brain up a little bit and make you feel better. Um, the problem with tricyclic antidepressants is they have a lot of side effects. And so that's why we moved in the direction of the SSRIs and things. And so there's a lot of tricyclics out there that are still used. They're often now used for something other than depression. Um, serotonin, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors are, are very much um, kind of the mainstream for depression treatment. And if not the SSRIs, it's the SNRIs, and that's the medications that work on serotonin and norepinephrine at the same time. Um, the benefit to the SNRIs is you're, you're kind of hitting the depression symptoms from two different angles with two different pathways. And so for many people that don't respond to SSRIs, they actually respond to SNRIs. And so you know, there's the benefit of them for some over the SSRIs. So here's a list of the old antidepressants. They're still around, they're still used. Like I said, they're used for different things. Um, Elevil, one of the first ones to come out, amitriptyline, um, it's actually a really good muscle relaxant. It's really good for neuropathic pain and fibromyalgia, probably better than it is for, for depression. Um, anaphronil is really good. Uh, it was one of the last ones to come out of this class. It's actually pretty good for depression, uh, has a lot of side effects. Uh, Tofranil, been around for a very long time. What is it best for? Bedwetting and kids. Um, it, it has a beneficial side effect of it causes urinary retention. And so when a child is bedwetting, uh, what do you want them to do? You want them to retain urine. So tofranil is a good choice for bedwetting. Um, the the, SS, the uh, tricyclic antidepressant Ascendin um, is actually basically works primarily on norepinephrine, but Ascendin itself um, kind of clued us into some things like well, maybe some of these old tricyclics are actually good for something like ADHD. And if you look at the Ascendin drug and the, uh, st the medication for the treatment of ADHD um, Stratera, you, you will find that they are very similar structures. Um, basically, one of the beneficial side effects of someone who took Ascendin for depression was they had more focus and attention. So it would be useful then in uh, the treatment of ADHD. Um, a lot that we learned from medications and what they were actually useful for was, um, you know, there's an intended effect of the medication, but there are other beneficial effects that come about. So say in, in the case of that is, you know, tofranil, yeah, it may help you with depression, but it's also good for bedwetting. Well, uh, Elevil is really good for, maybe it's good for some depression, but it's also really good for neuropathic pain or fibromyalgia. 
because of its muscle relaxant ability. And so there are the intended, intended effects of medication, there are beneficial side effects of medication, and then there are negative side effects of medication. Um, a lot of that off-labeled use that I talked about in that medication checklist is we're using medications for the other beneficial side effects that they have. So common side effects, fatigue, drowsiness, tremors, nightmares, restlessness, confusion. Um, it was pretty common for individuals who were on the tricyclics to experience nightmares. Um, it's like it can occur with the SSRIs as well. Uh, in both cases, the whole idea of nightmares associated with antidepressants is typically what we refer to as a transient side effect. It's a side effect that occurs and, and more or less diminishes within 90 days. Um, it's a good symptom or a good depictor of neurotransmitters are changing. When neurotransmitters start to change in your brain, like norepinephrine and serotonin, and the levels of them start to change, you can have very strange dreams. They can be hallucinogenic dreams. They can be terror dreams. They can be nightmares. Um, but those side effects that came from the TCAs and the SSRIs that, that are related to sleep and nightmares are typically transient. They go away within 90 days. Those medications that just work on serotonin for depression. So what do we have? Well, we have a very long list uh, the very first one to come out right around 1989, 1990 was Prozac. Um, Prozac was kind of like revolutionary at the time. There was nothing like it. There, there were, it, since it was the first SSRI and its side effect profile is better than the tricyclic antidepressants, many of those who had never been, um, you know, had therapeutic relief from the TCAs got relief from Prozac. Um, the, the problem with the older SSRIs is they take a long time to have effect. Um, the older SSRIs like Prozac and Zoloft typically take four to six weeks to have an effectiveness. It takes that long for the therapeutic level to be achieved in the brain and to start to feel the therapeutic effects. Um, that produced the need for doing something in the short term. And oftentimes what's, what we'd see in the early days was they might uh, an individual might be on a tricyclic antidepressant which was faster acting while they were on prozac while prozac was trying to come up to therapeutic effect when prozac was at the place of having a therapeutic effect you would start to remove them from the tricyclic because it was no longer needed um, you wouldn't if someone was chronically or severely depressed you wouldn't want to put them on something and say well in six weeks this will be helping you and so it's like that idea of with benzodiazepines versus SSRIs for anxiety, yet there's a need for something acutely and something long-term. And so, uh, you know, you would see some combinations going on where one of the medications would be removed after the other had a chance to have an effectiveness. Um, a lot of good stuff um, came out over the years. You know, many of these are very similar in nature. Uh, they some people tolerate Prozac better than they tolerate Selexa. Some people tolerate Zoloft better than Lubox. And so it's not that one is better than the other. It's about how well does the individual tolerate it. Um, Lubox is a really good SSRI. It was never promoted really well, so it was never used a lot. Uh, doesn't mean it wasn't good. It's just the company that produced it was little. They didn't have the money to promote it that the people that, you know, produced Zoloft and Paxil did. So... Um, it's not used as much or has never been used as much as a Prozac or Paxil. Um, a kind of the second generation of this class was Selexa and Lexapro. Uh, what made them unique was uh, if Prozac and, and Zoloft took six weeks to have an effectiveness, Selexa only took three to four weeks to have an effectiveness. Um, and so there was this movement of individuals into kind of remission of symptoms quicker. What individuals, when Selexa came on the market, what uh, research didn't show in the early days of Selexa research was Selexa itself was not what was actually having the effectiveness. The active metabolite, when your body gets a hold of Selexa and metabolizes it, 
you get Lexapro. It was the Lexapro drug that was actually having the effectiveness. So from Selexa came Lexapro. Lexapro is about the fastest acting SSRI we have. You can you can have effectiveness from Lexapro in 10 to 14 days. Um, so much different than from the days of four to six weeks with Prozac um, to, you know, 10 to 14 days with Lexapro. You have some older, you have some medications down here like Vibrix and Trintilex. I mean, they're not any great things. They're just different than some of the others. Um, this is more similar to Paxil. Vibrate is more similar to an old um, antidepressant called Desiril um, that was good, but had a lot of side effects. And so what happens with medications is medications come on the market, they're used. We realize that they have a lot of side effects. Companies go in, they try to clean up the drug molecule, molecule and to come up with something similar to the original medication that's going to be effective, but have less side effects. And that's what we do. Uh, that's what a lot of these are. The, the newer ones down here are similar to some of the older ones. They just, they're cleaner molecules, so they have, you have less side effects from them. Different side effects you see. Um, SSRIs are, are really um, bad about causing sexual side effects. Impotence in men, premature ejaculation. So they're not the best choice for men. Um, they're, they're other things like the newer stuff that came out, like Lexapro is a lot better to use in men than the older ones like Prozac because of the sexual side effects. Um, agitation, if an SSRI is causing agitation in someone, uh, what that should clue you into is, is the medication has some effectiveness not only on serotonin, but norepinephrine. The agitation comes from norepinephrine, not the serotonin. All of these work on serotonin and to much lesser effect norepinephrine. Uh, if they worked on serotonin and norepinephrine equally, they would be an SNRI, not an SSRI. The monoamine oxidase inhibitors were created right after, right before, I can't remember, right in the same time period of the tricyclic antidepressants. It was an attempt to, to instead of move to the place of increasing the effectiveness of a neurotransmitter, why don't we do something to decrease or destroy the enzyme that's eating up the, the neurotransmitter? So um, norepinephrine, dopamine, serotonin are destroyed by a monoamine en enzyme. And so these, the monoamine oxidase inhibitors, block that enzyme so the neurotransmitter stays around longer. The problem with blocking um, the enzyme that chews them up is you get a lot of other side effects. Um, individuals who were on these medications when they were on them had to be on very restricted diets because there are many things that if you block monoamine oxidase as an enzyme, when you block that, other things toxic build up in your body. Specifically, one of the things that the monoamine enzyme actually uh, destroyed that was dangerous was the, was the chemical tyramine in the body. Tyramine um, is fine when it's in normal levels, but if you've destroyed the enzyme that eats up tyramine, uh, what you end up is the body ends up in malignant hypertension and malignant hyperthermia. And so what that is, that's a body temperature of above 106 and blood pressure at stroke level. And so individuals that were on these medications, like I said, they had to have restrictive diets. They couldn't have anything that was high in tyramine. So that means they couldn't have cheese, chocolate, and wine, and so they were very unhappy. Uh, you, you, just, you get rid of all, a lot of the good things in life, and so there wasn't a lot of uh, compliance with these medications because the dietary restrictions with them were just unbearable. And if you didn't, if you didn't restrict your diet from things with tyramine in it, you ended up with a stroke or you ended up with malignant hyper hyperthermia, hyperthermia, which is, you know, your body temperature is above 106 and have brain damage. And so not a good, not a good class of medication. I, I remember in my lifetime when they were still being used, I uh, dispensed them as a pharmacist one time in 32 years. And it was Parnate that we were using, tranosipamine. A lot of side effects, headaches. What's not even listed as a side effect there is death. And that is one of the side effects of them because of the stroke level, blood pressure, and, the, and then the body temperature above 106. 
So if you bring serotonin and norepinephrine together, you get the SNRIs. There's a lot of those. Um, more of the market has moved in the direction of SNRIs than SSRIs. The first one to come out was Effexor. It, it came out um, about two years after Prozac, uh, kind of no, another one of those revolutionary things of here's an antidepressant that's working on serotonin and norepinephrine. It's, you know, it's bringing uh, effectiveness and symptom reduction to people who've never had symptom reduction. So it was really well received. Um, there's a lot of people that didn't tolerate something like effects are really well because um, one of the things that happens with, with the SNRIs is it would be better not to give them to someone who has a lot of anxiety along with their depression because the SNRIs, because they work on norepinephrine, increase your levels of anxiety as a, as a transient side effect for the first 90 days. And so if someone is already anxious, this is not the choice for them. Um, basically, the choice for them would be an SSRI. Uh, if they're, you know, if if they can tolerate it, yes, it's fine. They they work really well, but the SNRIs produce more anxiety in the first ninety days uh, because of the influence that they have on norepinephrine. Um, Desiril is the one that that I was talking about that is the the pred is the predecessor to Vibrate. Work, Desiril works really well, has a lot of side effects, makes you very drowsy, but really it was a really good SNRI. Um, Wellbutrin is a really good one, um, has a, a lot of usefulness. It's really good for adult, adult ADHD, smoking cessation, depression. It's, um, it's the um, antidepressant that was kind of quickly described as the motivator um, antidepressant. Um, when when this medication, bupropion, is metabolized uh, in the body, the first metabolite that comes about is diethylpropion. And diethylpropion is a diet pill that was legal in the 70s. And so uh, basically it, it was a stimulant. It basically stimulated you. It motivated you to get up and do something. And so had a lot of good usefulnesses. Um, it does increase anxiety. So if someone was depressive, and had a lot of anxiety, it was probably not a good choice. Uh, Searzone came out right after Effexor, uh, had, had a lot more uh, side effects than Effexor, so it wasn't used a lot. And like I mentioned earlier with Luvox, Rimron has been around, it's really good, it's, it has a lower side effect profile to many things, but the company that produced it was really small. They didn't, they didn't have the ability to market it as well, so it wasn't as used as much as the bigger name medications were, but it's a really good one. Uh, for, you know, someone that has a depression and without anxiety. Of the different medications that, that you treat, uh, you know, depression with, uh, here's your strange dreams again. Um, Paxil is really bad about causing strange dreams. Uh, Paxil is, uh, I, I've worked with clients that used to drop acid and, and loved LSD, and they said when they were on Paxil, it felt like they were back on LSD because, their dreams were so trippy, like uh, like LSD dreams produced. And so um, the thing about these medications is know that there's side effects. A lot of these side effects are related to, um, you know, how this is working on norepinephrine, so it agitates you. Strange dreams and sleep disturbances, that's the serotonin thing. Norepinephrine is increasing your blood pressure. Serotonin can make you drowsy. So their side effects, and many of these side effects are transient and they go away after the first 90 days. So when you, when you think about working with clients that are on medication, one of the things I say is get all the information. You know, I love to timeline things. You know, you know when did someone start taking medication? You know, did they, were they taking medication as a child or did they start taking it as an adolescent? Did they take medication as an adult? If you can kind of plot their medication over over their lifespan, you can kind of understand how medication might have affected, you know, brain development or how medication might have, maybe the side effects of the medication might have led to them being diagnosed with a different mental disorder than, than, than what they were originally diagnosed with. So, you know, I like to 
timeline medications of somebody who's been on medication for a long time and kind of overlap that with age and developmental stage. And that starts to really clue you into, well, look, you know, at, at age blank, they were taking this medication. Um, pre previously, they had been diagnosed as blank. Now they're diagnosed with this. Well, you know, is it really this disorder or is it a side effect to the medication? So, you know, doing really good medication histories, timelining when somebody was taking stuff really helps to kind of predict and, and, and give you a really good idea of, you know, are the symptoms in front of me really the disorder or is, are the symptoms in front of me due to something else? So yeah, I do a lot of timelining. Timelining. We won't even talk about that. I like to do, I like to talk about and think about, you know, if someone is having medication side effects, what can we do to help them with the side effects? You're not going to be able to change their medication. You shouldn't be telling them how to take their medication. You should be referring them back to the doctor to tell them how to take their medication. But, you know, if their medication makes them drowsy, what can you do? What can you what can you do to help them be less drowsy? Well, you can do something creative. You can get them up, get them moving around. You can help, you know, I work with a lot of kids. And so if a kid is drowsy, if I get them to playing a game, they get less drowsy. So what can you actually do therapeutically as a counselor to help combat some of these medication side effects? There's a lot of things you can do. And I like to kind of list out my side effects and think about what interventions I can do to help deal with their, their fatigue or their drowsiness, or you know, their clarity, their mental clarity. Um, there's a lot of things that we can do to kind of, you know, wake them up, warm them up, get them ready uh, so that they're, you know, not as, you know, affected by the medications. Schizophrenia, complex. Um, I mean, we've been treating schizophrenia for decades. Um, it's it's such a complex mental disorder because it involves so many areas of the brain and so many neurotransmitters. The average uh, atypical antipsychotic that works to help someone with positive and negative symptoms of schizophrenia works on all neurotransmitters at at least 10 different locations in the brain. So they're really comprehensive um, that, that working in a lot of different places on a lot of different transmit neurotransmitters is the thing that causes all the side effects that you see associated with medications used to treat schizophrenia. If you're working on that much at one time, you're gonna have a side effect. So in schizophrenia, there's dopamine involvement. And the old medications that worked on dopamine are listed here. Thorazine was a big one. So was um, Stelazine and, and Melaril. Um, Thorazine, a lot of side effects associated with it. Um, a, a unique fact about Thorazine, if um, I've actually seen two or three different people with this, um, individuals who have hiccups that will not go away, uh, if they get a if they're giving an injection, if they are given an injection of Thorazine, their hip, hiccups will go away. Um, if nothing else works, Thorazine is the is the way to get rid of hiccups. Um, very complex mechanism relates to dopamine and muscles. Uh, but uh, there are individuals who get the hiccups and nothing will make them go away other than Thorazine. Uh, Compazine, never useful as an antipsychotic, is really good for nausea. Um, Trilophon, never really good for um, uh, psychosis, but it was really good for anxiety. Um, basically, why was it good for anxiety? It just knocked everybody out so they knew that they weren't anxi they, they didn't know they were anxious anymore. They were just put to sleep. Lots of um, lots of side effects. Um, think about akathisia. Um, that's an internal restlessness. Akinesia is movement disorders. Different class of old antipsychotics would be Haldol. Um, Haldol was one of the first to be developed um, as an injectable, so that you could actually those who were not compliant. On the oral medications, they could be given a once-a-month injection of Haldol to control some of the symptoms of schizophrenia. Uh, it has a lot of side effects. It's not used as much as it was used before. It's typically like Thorazine now used as kind of chemical uh, restraint. Um, basically, you want to knock someone down quickly, you give them a dose of Haldol or, or Thorazine. 
Um, but it was one of the very first to come out in a long-acting uh, injectable so that if, if someone would not take their medication, you could give them a dose of Haldol. It would last for 30 days because uh, the Haldol chemical was suspended in oil. And it would be slowly released throughout the body over a 30-day period. ORAP was never really good, caused liver damage, and was taken off the market pretty quickly in the United States at least. Same side effects to uh, to these uh, atyp these typical antipsychotics. If you start looking at the newer atypical antipsychotics, they work on dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine. They work on a little bit of everything. Acetylcholine. Here's a good depictor of the the typical um, atypical. Um, basically, look at these pie charts. Um, and look at what they represent over here. These are all the neurotransmitters or receptor types that each of these antipsychotics works on. So the goal of, of a good uh, atypical antipsychotic is to have the most pie pieces of pie as equal as possible. And so if you'll look at this, clozapine has the best distribution. Um, clozapine, for those who can tolerate it, can really um, effectively remove or reduce positive and negative symptoms of schizophrenia. However, to do this, uh, to have a medication that is this equally distributed across all these receptor types, it causes a lot of side effects. Uh, before uh, the research was good on clozapine, a lot of people died as a result of clozapine because those who do not, do not tolerate clozapine, they either end up with clozapine destroying their red blood cells or their white blood cells. So they become anemic and die or they become uh, immune deficient and die. Those who tolerate it well really are, really are positively affected by clozapine. Clozapine was taken off the market for a while. They came up with a monitoring system for it. Um, only certain doctors can prescribe it. Only certain pharmacists can can dispense it. And basically to be on clozapine, you have to be in a monitoring program where before the doctor writes a prescription, your blood work has to be done. Before the pharmacist dispense it, they have to look at your blood work and make sure everything's in alignment. And then if everything's in alignment, if your white blood cell, red blood cell count is all where it should be, you get your prescription for clozapine. Because those who tolerate clozapine really well have have a really uh, beneficial outcome from the reduction of positive and negative symptoms of schizophrenia. Uh, the next closest to it, ability, um, you know, not likely to kill you, but uh, Zyprexa is kind of the next one. And then you see all the other ones like Risperdal and some of the other ones here. So um, one of the reasons why atypicals cause a lot of side effects is because they're working on so many different neurotransmitters at different sites. Here's just another depictor of, you know, where are the atypicals working? They're working everywhere. They're working all over the place. So the early days of atypical antipsychotics, the first one to come out was Loxetane, then Zyprexa and Seroquel. And then you have things like Risperdal and Invega come out. Um, then I mean, side effects for sedation, cognitive blunting, dizziness, movement disorders because of their effects on dopamine. Um, other kind of like the next generation of atypicals, you have things like Geodon and Moban. You have Abilify, Latuda, Fanap, Cypress. And um, basically, it's used now for um, bipolar disorder, but escalith or lithium was originally released on the market as an antipsychotic. Uh, it's not used for that anymore, but basically it was originally an antipsychotic. Um, all of these are similar in nature. Uh, for the, It's kind of like with other medications, it's not about one being better than the other, it's about which one of these does the individual tolerate better. And sometimes that's kind of a trial and error. You know, say this individual is put on Zyprexa and they gain a lot of weight because um, Zyprexa is known to cause a sudden weight gain, you know, up to 30 pounds in the first three months. It causes a chemical metabolism kind of syndrome that makes that that's, looks very similar to diabetes, but it's not. It's, it's reversible after the medication is reduced. 
So if they're not tolerating it because of side effects, then maybe they'll do better on Abilify, or maybe they would do better on Latuda. So it's not about one is better than the other, it's about what is tolerated better by the individual. Same side effects that you see in all the other ones, movement, movement disorders and drowsiness, confusion, um, things like uh, cognitive blunting because of their effects on dopamine and norepinephrine. I love these slides, you know, here's, here's your normal brain with, uh, without ADHD and with ADHD. And what these are showing is, is more or less um, look at the overactivity or underactivity in the different brains. Um, that's the one, one of the good things about PET scans and functional MRIs is you can, you can look at things like this and, and the idea of over, I mean, fully functioning, not fully functioning. Calm, not calm. Um, balanced function, overreactivity. Uh, very, you know, active, inactive. So PET scans. So the next class of medications to think about would be the medications that are used for the treatment of ADHD. <clears throat> the, um, the medication Provigil is kind of within the CNS stimulant class. It's not typically used for the treatment of ADHD. Um, Provigil was created specifically for nursing home patients who were on so many medications that they couldn't wake up to take their medication. So Provigil was created to wake them up so they could take medication. It has many other uses, but Provigil is exactly what it sounds like, Provigilance, as in uh, the first time this came out, what, how, is it being, how is it being prescribed and what was it being prescribed for? lethargic nursing home patients who needed to be awake long enough to take their medication. Not bright, but that's what it was. Uh, it's really good for a lot of different things like sleep disorders actually. It makes no sense. I know that a stimulant is used for sleep disorder, but there are things like narcolepsy. Uh, some of the stimulants actually work well for sleep disorder in their complexity. The amphetamine types of, of ADHD medication from the old things like um, Dexedrine and desoxin, all the way to the newer things like Adderall and Vyvanse. Um, you'll know that de note that desoxin is methamphetamine. That is not the same thing as crystal meth. Uh, it is both are methamphetamine, but they are structurally different. We don't give crystal meth to children for the treatment of ADHD, but desoxin, which is the methyl salt of amphetamine, is used for the treatment of ADHD. What do they cause side effect wise? You know, if one of the things about ADHD medications, if if someone is ADHD and they're put on ADHD medications, they get better. If they don't get better, they're probably not ADHD. It's one of the really good tests is 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 with ADHD. If you have ADHD, you're put on ADHD medication, you get better. If you don't get better, you probably don't have ADHD. Um, what happens if you don't have ADHD medicate? ADHD and you're put on ADHD medication, instead of you getting focus, attention, impulse control, hyperactivity control, what you get is agitation and aggression. So they become aggressive, or they become restless, or they become nervous. Um, like I mentioned with other medications, no specific ADHD medication is better than the other. They're just one may be tolerated by one individual better than the other is tolerated. Um, some people may tolerate Ritalin better than they tolerate um, something like Adderall. So it's about individual differences and what's better for them and not what's there. Because if you put them up side by side, there's no real effectiveness difference between the different ones. Here's your other um, medications used for um, ADHD. They're stimulants, but they're not amphetamines. And that's your Ritalin, Concerta, Metadate, Methylene. Your Focalin and your Daytrona. Daytrona was the first one to actually come out in a patch, and basically you see it's it's Ritalin in a patch. Focalin is primarily used for the treatment of mild and moderate ADHD. Um, it's probably the, I would call it the weakest of the non-amphetamines. Um, it may be used for um, I've seen it used a lot in in kids that have ADHD. They they give them something like Adderall in the morning, and they give them Focalin, which is shorter acting in the afternoon so they can finish their homework, but they're not still affected so much by the medication that they can't go to sleep at night. So 
um, it, it has many different uses. Cause the same types of side effects and symptoms as um, as the other ones. You know, the your sleep problems, agitation, nervousness. It's interesting. Silert. Um, it's been removed from the market now. Um, it um, caused some liver damage problems. But it was interesting that one of the side effects of Silert was depression. And it was never quite understood how it was causing depression, other than the fact that it was such a potent dopamine, um, you know, so such a potent thing that acting on dopamine, they were they were looking at it from the perspective was was it was it stimulating dopamine production to the point that the cells that produce dopamine were they becoming depleted of dopamine? And so if they're depleted of dopamine, you have de you, you end up with some depression symptoms. So norepinephrine um, stratera, um, it's one of the, 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 I guess the last ADHD medications that were created. Um, it is similar to that antidepressant that I showed you earlier, Ascendin, kind of moxipine. Um, it works on presynaptic norepinephrine. It, um, it's not a very strong medication. It's primarily used um, for mild ADHD. You know, those who have severe ADHD symptoms would not get much benefit from Sertera. Um, those who have mild or moderate symptoms might get some benefit from it. But uh, since it works primarily on, no, on norepinephrine instead of dopamine, it would be reserved for mild, moderate inst instead of chronic or severe. Um, Sleep disorders, there's so many different types of sleep disorders. Uh, the ones we're going to talk about are the ones that are um, basically think about insomnia and something like that as a sleep disorder. Uh, most of the medications that are out there to treat sleep disorders actually work on, um, the older ones work on GABA. Um, GABA, you know, things that work on uh, the anti-anxiety medications make you sleepy, but they're not really good for sleep disorders. And so other medications that came along from that kind of vein of research are the medications that are used for sleep disorders. And so um, what's out there now? There, there's a lot that have been on the market that have been removed from the market. Um, things that are kind of in the similar class that work on GABA, you have Ambien, Prosom, Lunesta, and Sonata. Um, the older ones that worked on um, on GABA that are still around, Halcyon and Restoril. Um, the thing about Halcyon was Halcyon is very potent. The dosages of Halcyon, um, let's say Ambien, you take five or 10 milligrams. Halcyon, you take 0.25 milligrams. It's the differences in potency. When Halcyon first came out, um, one of those things where research, there wasn't enough research to understand it. Halcyon um, came out, when it came out in the market years ago, it came out in dosages of 0.25 milligrams and 0.5 milligrams. And, and basically, it was really common to see someone be prescribed 0.5 milligrams or two of the 0.5 milligrams at bedtime. Well, what was happening because it's such a potent um, sleep aid, people would go to sleep and never wake up. Basically, they would they would die in their sleep. Uh, it was really common older adults who have different metabolisms as a result of age. And so Halcyon is one of the medications that was taken off the market for a while, restudied, and when it came back on the market, it came back on the market with a lot of restrictions and much lower dosing prescribe, uh, limits because a milligram of Halcyon can put you to sleep forever, where 0.125 milligrams of Halcyon can help you sleep. Um, very big difference. Ambien, Ambien has a lot of side effects. Ambien can put you in a state of, of amnesia. It can put you in a state of, of kind of like being in a blackout where you can be fully walking around, interacting with individual, but you're out, you're done. Um, you're, you're, people have been known to, to drive while on Ambien. They're, uh, they are asleep, but they are not asleep. I mean, Ambien is, is unique in that way. Um, yeah, of course, the side effect of a sleep aid is fatigue. Yep, it's gonna make you sleepy. 
Um, other than that, I mean, doesn't necessarily have a lot of side effects. It's not a benzodiazepine, so it doesn't have some of the side effects that benzos do. Um, most of the things that make you drowsy also make you clumsy. Um, the other class of medication, you have rosirum. Um, it's based on the melatonin molecule. Um, not used a lot, not very effective. Um, some people, you know, it works for, some people it doesn't. Um, melatonin itself is a hormone. Um, there's never been a lot of research done on melatonin. We know that it's effective as a sleep aid, um, but most of the dosages of melatonin that are available at Walmart and wherever you get them are actually too high. Um, the effective dose of melatonin is 300 micrograms, which is 0.3 milligrams. Anything over 0.3 milligrams or 300 micrograms is too much. Since melatonin is a hormone, when you take too much of melatonin, it affects your other hormone levels. All hormones are connected together in the endocrine system. And so you affect one hormone, you're going to affect all hormones. And so the effective dose of melatonin is 0.3 milligrams or 300 micrograms, not 3 milligrams, not 5 milligrams, not 10 milligrams, 0.3 milligrams. That has been studied, that has been studied to be effective, and anything over that is actually no more effective than 0.3 milligrams. And so, unique things about melatonin. GABA. Um, mood stabilization using uh, anticonvulsants. And so, seizure medications, yes, they're used for seizures. Uh, they're also very useful in the treatment of mood stabilization. In many ways, if, if, you're, if you're kind of looking at the two classes of medications that are used to treat um, mood, you have the atypical antipsychotics that are used for mood stabilization, and you have the seizure medications, the anticonvulsants. Side effect profile-wise, um, the anticonvulsants are better for mood stabilization than the atypicals are. Um, just like any medications, some people tolerate anti, you know, atypical antipsychotics better than they t and tolerate these anticonvulsants and then kind of the opposite. Uh, some don't tolerate these well or don't get the therapeutic effectiveness out of them. Um, they all have side effects, you know, like weight gain and fatigue and drowsiness. Um, but there are many people actually do benefit from these for mood stabilization and have less side effects than the other one. Topamax has many different uses. It's used for migraines, it's used for weight control, it's used for seizures, mood stabilization, a lot of different things. Trigeminal neuralgia. Um, Depakote um, causes you to gain a lot of weight and it may be useful, but there's a lot of weight gain associated with it. I'm gonna t stop for a minute and look at the, the uh, <laughs> if you, uh, if you only take the effective dose of 0.3 milligrams of melatonin, can you take it ongoing without issue? Yes, you can. Uh, that's the thing. That's the only dose that's actually been uh, studied, and they studied it for long-term effectiveness. And so 0.3 milligrams or 300 micrograms can be taken on a regular basis without any issue. Going over that, you start affecting other hormone levels. And so the thing is, it's really hard to find 0.3 milligrams. You have to look around for it. You're not going to find 0.3 milligrams at Walmart or wherever you get it because Walmart's selling 1 milligram, 3 milligram, 5 milligram, and 10 milligram. And so you'll have to look around to find that dosage, 300 micrograms or 0.3 milligrams. Side effects, very similar to the side effects that you see in, in, in some of the atypicals, dizziness, drowsiness, blurred vision, fatigue, lethargy, being tired all the time. Uh, just like many things that make you drowsy or tired they can make you um, actually you know be unstable your your walking is unstable you kind of stagger around cognitive disorders think about um, not just things like um, like alzheimer's disease but think about other cognitive disorders there's lewy body dementia there's all types of apraxias and aphasias and things that go into the cognitive disorders um, the first medication to come out more than three decades ago was Aricept, um, basically, and, you know, that's working on acetylcholine. Then you have some of the newer ones that came out, like Namenda, that work on NMDA receptors. 
and and basically the thing is is this is helpful and this is helpful but no, no one of these actually is helpful enough other than to kind of um, curtail the the progression of of alzheimer's they don't stop the progression of alzheimer's they they may slow the process uh, medications like Nemzarig, which is a combination of these two different medications, may be more beneficial. There was a, a new Alzheimer's medication that came on the market recently. Um, you know, there was a lot of controversy around it because of its side effect profile. I don't even list it because um, it was rushed to market. It has too many side effects. And unless somebody really wants to chance it, I would say stay away from it. Um, stay with what's on the market which has been proven to be effective or useful the thing about alzheimer's disease is we still don't know enough about it we know that there are multiple mechanisms that create alzheimer's and we're not you know we're not at the place at the moment to um, treat it effectively uh, we, we can slow it but we can't prevent it we can we can slow its progression but we can't stop it completely um, one of the things that was studied a long time ago um, that's actually effective in early stage Alzheimer's is nicotine. Um, nicotine is stimulates the the uh, nicotine stimulates the production of acetylcholine uh, at muscarinic receptors. Um, and so I'm not saying you know they weren't recommending that people go out and start to smoke, but nicotine replacement things like the patches were actually useful in early stage Alzheimer's because they would help with the cognitive function. Um, it was never, you know, brought to market for that. Uh, it was never, you know, nobody ever thought about it because uh, everybody thinks of nicotine as that evil thing that you get addicted to, but it has some beneficial uses. Um, in, in your body, acetylcholine works at two different receptors. One is called a muscarinic receptor and the other one is called a nicotinic receptor. So if you have a receptor in your body that's called nicotinic, there's a reason why nicotine works on things. And so you can, there are uses for it uh, that were never actually published or brought to market just because there's so much negative, you know, stigma around nicotine. And so, it, but no, no one was ever recommending people with Alzheimer's go out and start to smoke. They were just recommending that they were, they used uh, nicotine packages in the early stages. Substance use disorders, um, treated from a lot of different ways because there's a lot of different theories behind it. Um, it's kind of like Alzheimer's disease. There's a lot of theories behind it. There's there's the, the dopamine pathway theory. There's a serotonin pathway theory. And so the medications used to treat uh, or help someone with substance use disorder is kind of varied. Here's kind of a list of the medications that are out there and they work different ways. Um, Chantix is for smoking, Zyban is for smoking, and all the rest of them are for like opioid addiction or alcohol um, use disorder or something like that. So a lot of different things. Disulfiram was an aversion therapy. Basically, it prevented uh, one of the enzymes from, from it, it, that, that break down alcohol in your body from breaking down alcohol. And so by preventing that enzyme, it caused the, the buildup of aldehyde in your body which made you nauseated. So if you were on disulfiram and you drank, aldehyde built up in your body and it made you throw up. So it was an aversion tactic uh, to treat substance use disorder. It was not very effective. Um, methadone uh, was used, or still used in the treatment of opioid addiction, as is things like Revia and, and Suboxone. If someone has, or if someone is taking um, the old um, antipsychotics like Haldol, Thorazine, one of the big problems with the old antipsychotics was they heavily worked on dopamine. And when you reduce dopamine levels to the place of having an effectiveness of schizophrenia, you, you end up causing a set of symptoms that look like Parkinson's disease in individuals. And, and so, the symptoms are called tardive dyskinesia, so there's movement disorder, tick disorders. Uh, some of them could be, you know, pill rolling with your fingers or licking your lips, but these were, you know, a cluster of symptoms called tardive dyskinesia. Um, the thing about that is in the early days when, that's, when those medications were first being used, 
um, no one knew anything about or knew, didn't know enough about the extra pyramidal system that I mentioned before that dopamine and acetylcholine are in, are in kind of a balance. And so you use the old antipsychotics, dopamine is depleted, acetylcholine becomes too prevalent, you get tardive dyskinesia. It's really easy to prevent tardive dyskinesia by using cogentin, artane, or, ben, artane or Benadryl. That acts to reduce the acetylcholine levels and prevents the de development of tardive dyskinesia with the old antipsychotics and some of the newer antipsychotics. So there's Benadryl again used with the old antipsychotics. Um, you have some some kind of off off the wall little things like uh, Inversine that was used that can be used for Tourette's. You have Revia that can be used for we don't even use these terminologies anymore. Like they, Revia, which is now Trexone, we use it for opioid uh, use disorder. Can also be used for the what we used to call pervasive developmental disorder. Um, odd mechanisms of action and never really well studied. Other medications that have psychiatric uses, um, and with some really good studies behind them. Um, the old beta blocker for blood pressure, Enderol, for pranolol, is really good for intimate explosive disorder and PTSD. Um, by blocking beta receptors, you, you decrease the effectiveness of norepinephrine. And norepinephrine is the neuro, one of the neurotransmitters that's kind of the culprit in symptoms of, uh, of PTSD and intermittent explosive disorder. So by blocking the beta receptor, norepinephrine can't act at it, so you reduce the symptoms of these two disorders. Another thing about Enderol, and it's been studied a lot, um, it was studied a long time ago from the perspective of if you take a low dose of Enderol before you take a standardized test, uh, it will increase your performance on a standardized test by up to 20 points. And so basically it was because Enderol is calming you down, but keeping you focused. And so, um, yeah, I mean, you can go back and look at old studies and basically test uh, performance anxiety, test anxiety. Uh, there was a lot of studies 30 years ago on take 20 milligrams of Enderol before the exam and it would make you perform better. And it actually is true. Um, Catapress, clonidine, um, used quite a lot. Um, in the treatment of conduct disorder, ADHD, the aggression associated with some ADHD, Tourette's, um, the other blood pressure, clonidine is a blood pressure medication, um, and so is guanfacin. It's uh, for the treatment of ADHD and, and things like that. It's available under the name of Intuniv. Um, as a blood pressure medication, it's called Tenex. Both catapress and Intuniv work at alpha receptors in the brain. They were, years ago when they came out, they were the first um, blood pressure medications that worked centrally on the brain to reduce blood pressure. That's, they also worked centrally on the brain to reduce aggression and things like that. And so the issue with this and the use of clonidine and Intuniv is, is they cause, if you don't have yeah, you're maybe using it for ADHD or conduct disorder, but it's also going to have an effect on your blood pressure. So children that are taking these medications for ADHD conduct disorder, they often have uh, their blood pressure bottoms out and they fall out. Uh, they get up, what we have, we refer to as orthostatic hypotension. When they get up, their blood pressure bottoms out and they fall down. Um, so one of the things that has to be monitored for anyone that's on these two medications that don't have blood pressure, high blood pressure, is does it reduce their blood pressure too much? Uh, it causes basically hypotension, or what I refer to as orthostatic hypotension, which is, is, is when you get up, your blood pressure bottoms out, you fall down. So that's orthostatic hypotension. Very similar side effects to many other things, drowsiness. It's a blood pressure medication. Hopefully it does cause you know reduction in blood pressure. Irritability and depression, catapress, since it's working centrally, can cause some, some depression type symptoms and irritability um, because catapress and Intuniv are both working on alpha receptors in the brain where norepinephrine actually bonds. Norepinephrine bonds to beta receptors and it also bonds to alpha receptors. And that is us 
and we'll get down here. If you're if you're ever looking for good videos to kind of look at the whole idea of medicating different categories of you know children, adolescents, here's a list of some of the medic some of the videos that are great. I love the medicating kids from Frontline in 2001. The Medicated Child from Frontline in 2008, which was a follow-up to the 2001 one. Um, you can find this one on YouTube if you'll look up Generation Meds Over Medication of Foster Care Children. Uh, it'll uh, it'll show you some some real odd medication practices that were really common uh, uh, 10 years ago. There were many states that required for children who were in the foster care system, regardless of age, that they had to be on medication to be in the foster care system. And, and basically, um, Florida was one of, the, one of the big states where this was going on. And, and in this documentary, uh, basically, they uncover 18-month-old uh, kids on medication because they were in the foster care system, but they didn't have any reason to be on medication. So it's a really good expo on kind of over-medicating kids. There's the list of the medication um, sites that I was telling you about. The up-to-date one's the one that I wouldn't buy because it's too expensive, but it's really good. And the my favorite textbook for reading and understanding psychopharmacology um, that's written in a way that's easy to understand without trying to dumb it down too much is this, Basic Psychopharmacology for Mental Health Professionals, the third edition's two years old. Um, I've used this book since the first edition. I have all three editions. You know, it's a it's a great book. I don't get anything for telling you that this is a great book. It's just my favorite book. It's the the favorite book that I would recommend for any counselor. You know, wanting to learn something about psychopharmacology, wanting to know enough information to be good advocates for your clients. This is the one that I think is the best. And that's us. And I will stop sharing and we can talk. So, questions. What questions might you have? So there's one in the chat. Do you have an opinion about long-term use of Ambien? Did you, have, did you see that one yet? I don't think you did. I didn't see it. I mean, it, it's like anything that works on GABA, it was never studied for long-term use. And so you don't know what you're gonna get. Um, I know people that have been on it for years that have had no issue, but it's not been studied for long-term use. If you, you kind of start to dig in those things that work on GABA, you'll see that they were all studied and intended for short-term use. Um, but I've not, I've not seen anything negative or positive. Uh, just know that anything that works on GABA, like a benzodiazepine does, the longer you use it, the more likely it is to cause memory deficits as a side effect. Benzodiazepines or things that work on GABA are known even after one dose to depress your memory up to six weeks. So the longer you use it, the longer it has the ability to depress your memory. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the other question is, what about side effects related to birth control? Such as? I mean, there's a lot of side effects. I don't know, effects. Angelica. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's a lot of side effects, you know, in many different directions. Angelica it's that hormone specific. thing. I, 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 I would, you yeah. know, from birth control perspective, I'm, I, I would think about this from the perspective of it's hormonal. It's working on hormones. Anytime you affect one hormone, you affect all hormones. And remember, hormones are neuromodulators that are there for neurotransmitters to communicate with. And so they can interfere with neurotransmitters and can then produce symptoms or, or whatever, you know, their effectiveness, the effectiveness of the neurotransmitters. And so that would be one of those things is the hormone is a neuromodulator that affects a neurotransmitter that causes a symptom. Okay, all right. And Mario, why don't you come on and ask your question verbally? Hi, sorry. Um, um, earlier in the program, you talked about uh, myelation deficits, and you said that there are therapies that you can do to remyelate. That's the correct term. Mm -hmm. Remyelinate, yeah. Yep. So any, so here's the unique thing: if you start digging into research, you'll find you'll find different veins of research. Research into creativity and brain 
is one of the ones that helps re restore myelin. And there's also, uh, there's also kind of a, a line of research looking at mindfulness. And so think about it from a first perspective of, if you got two hemispheres of your brain, you got your left hemisphere that's very analytic, and you've got your right hemisphere that's very laid back and creative. Um, if you do creative things, it has the ability to affect and moderate the left side. Uh, but if you do creative things, it also has the ability to help your body kind of regenerate, uh, both from a neuronal level um, to the perspective of um, if, you're, if you've damaged a, neuron, a neuronal pathway by doing something creative, your body has, or your brain has the ability to strengthen the side pathways to make them stronger, to take the place of the main pathway that's damaged. And so it may not necessarily repair the myelin, but it strengthens the, the other pathways. You know, there's, our, our, our brain is organized where we have kind of like the, the, the main road to accomplish something, but we also have some side roads. And when the main road gets damaged, we have the ability to strengthen the side roads to do the, do the same thing that the main road did. Um, and you do that through creativity and mindfulness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So um, while you all are thinking of at least one more question to share with Dr. A. Hedgeth, um, I want to mention the certificates. I have put the link in the chat. And some students will often say, why should I fill out a certificate evaluation? Well, you're creating your scope of practice. You're showing that you have training in this area. So it's important to get those certificates now and start collecting them and holding on to them so that you are able to demonstrate the scope of practice you've had beyond the courses you've taken in the program. And then Dr. Hudson, there's an omega-3 question. Um, I have never seen, I, I, I had muted, my dogs decided to bark at FedEx outside. Um, I've never <laughs> seen any research that shows omega-3 is useful in myelination. Um, I've seen it really good about cleaning out your arteries for cholesterol, but I've never seen omega and, and it might, you know, there's so much that we don't know. There's so much that, that we're just understanding. The university I graduated from 100 years ago, Ole Miss, uh, basically has a natural products research center and that's what they're known for. That pharmacy school has like the, the, the world renowned natural products research center and they send people all over the world digging up roots and dirt and looking at the natural products of it. And so, so much comes out of that kind of research, you know, you know, the, the treatment of, of malignant melanoma with mistletoe came out of Ole Miss, you know, treatment of glaucoma with marijuana came out of Ole Miss. And so it's, there's that kind of stuff of there's a lot that we are just beginning to understand. And I'm, and, you know, I'm not going to say that it's not going to help, but we don't have any good evidence yet, you know. It's kind of like the evidence around, does it really help to get genetic testing around mental illness? Well, I think it's informative, you know, it's very informational. It really helps us understand things, but should we base a diagnosis on a genetic test for mental illness? Not yet. Should we, if we take our symptoms, if we take a PET scan and put it with some genetic testing, we're really forming a really good picture of things, but there's a lot of stuff we're not to the place of yet of, making it, giving it the, 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 the credibility that it should have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I would like to just thank you so much for being here. It has been amazing. I personally have even learned some things along the way too. So I really Enjoyed appreciate it. that. Yes, Very thank exact. you again for being here and everybody make sure you fill out the certificate evaluations. Um, we value your feedback, your input, yep. your ideas for future webinars as well. And thank you again, Frank. Really appreciate you. All right. Glad to have be a good here. Night. Email me if you have questions. Happy to answer them. Thank right. you. Bye, everyone. Lots of kudos. <laughs>